Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. We have some great turnout already. Over 100 people are logged in online. And so welcome to the spring meeting of the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics. My name is Matt Pritchard. I'm one of the members of this committee, and we are pleased to present this session uh, today on novel geophysical data sets for environmental applications, moving from discovering signals to societal benefit. Before I begin the presentation today, I just will tell you a little bit more about the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics. Um, on this side, you'll see um, a slide that's going to be showing. Uh, you'll see some information on the mission of this uh, committee. This committee is composed uh, and funded by four federal agencies, the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of Energy, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. The committee uses its convening functions to support community discussions like the one we're having today, about interactions between solid earth geophysics and federal agencies and societal benefits, um, encouraging greater understanding of a range of, of geophysical topics and areas of emerging interest and in research. Our meeting uh, resources, webinars, and videos are produced under the auspices of the committee and are available all online. And today I'll now tell you a little bit about today's meeting and our goals for today. Um, environmental seismology, geodesy, and geoelectrics are growing fields that use geophysical sensors in novel ways to learn about environmental conditions. These disciplines extend the well-known discipline of environmental geophysics by using large sensor networks, continuous time series, and high-performance computing to develop new ways of looking at the conventional data, oftentimes finding useful signals in other people's noise. Some links currently exist among the disciplines and have been underway, but for the next steps in the solid earth geophysical community to nurture these interdisciplinary fields, we'd like to use today's uh, workshop to help us engage and understand how we can engage new potential users and ensure that we are addressing uh, societal problems in fields such as oceanography, hydrology, atmospheric science, and geomorphology. Uh, we may need to have discussions about how we can uh, meet these needs by modifying instrument networks, creating new facilities for data sharing and discoverability, and helping to operationalize these discoveries. So today we're gonna to begin our first session with overview talks, followed by an array of uh, shorter talks on the latest developments in environmental seismology. And our last panel will discuss uh, examples of using satellite gravimetry and hydrological applications. Uh, I have a few announcements before we begin. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days. In addition to questions from the committee members, we plan to take questions from the audience. Simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question in a box and click send. Any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our video recording. In the interest of time, we will skip committee introductions. Bios of our committee members are located in the Academy's website and the link can be found in the chat. I do want to thank all of our speakers for all the work they put into giving presentations today. I really look forward to hearing from all of them. And I will now start our first session and introduce our, our first speaker. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Christine Larson uh, from the University of Colorado as our first speaker. Uh, Christine and Sarah will each have 20 minutes to speak, uh, plus five minutes for Q&A. And then we'll have, uh, after both talks are completed, uh, another 20 minutes or so for group discussion. So we'll begin with Christine. Uh, Christine has uh, an AB degree in engineering from Harvard and received her PhD at Scripps Institution of, of Oceanography. Um, she's been at the University of Colorado as a faculty member since 1990. Uh, Christine has a great uh, Twitter uh, account called Fun with GPS, which well reflects all of the fun that she's had with GPS over her career, uh, earning numerous uh, awards, uh, including the uh, Prince uh, Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Creativity Prize for Water in Saudi Arabia. Um, she's also a member of the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences. Um, during her research is focused uh, on all sorts of aspects of using GPS, measuring plate motions, measuring ice sheet speeds, uh, using a, a GPS receiver as a seismometer, um, and many other environmental applications that we'll hear about today. So now, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Christine. Okay. Share. Is that, can you guys see that? Yes, it looks great. Okay, get the show on the road. All right, thank you very much for this introduction to speak. I'm gonna give you um, a short interview, excuse me, overview on um, hydrogeodesy and GPS. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the themes of this meeting. How can we help um, the different communities work together? 
Uh, I'm first going to start out talking to, to you about what I mean by GPS interferometric reflectometry, which is the technique my group developed. Uh, just a nomenclature thing, GNSS is just a generic term for GPS. I'm going to talk about applications of this technique, and then, like I said, I'll talk at the end about how we can make this more available to people. So what is GNSS IR or GPS IR? Well, it's essentially making each GPS site into a radar. So by static radar in particular, um, it's a little bit different than regular radar in that I use very low elevation angles. And I'm using forward scatter or what a GPS person would call multipath from planar surfaces near the antenna. Uh, as Matt was saying, this is a noise or he was talking about using noise. This is very much a noise for uh, geodesis. And then the other distinctive thing about this technique is I'm using normal GPS GNSS instruments. Nothing's been changed. The antenna is pointed towards zenith. I'm not doing anything to um, optimize it for reflections, which means I can use data from other networks. So this is my geometry slide to show you how this works. Basically, GPS, everyone, including everyone using GPS in their phones, is getting a direct signal from multiple satellites. Here I'm just showing one signal. Um, but there's also signals that are coming down that are going to reflect off planar surfaces below the antenna. So I'm showing the geometry of an antenna above some generic planar surface. It could be ice, it could be snow, it could be water, it could be bare soil. And you can see that this reflected signal, and these are my little symbols for elevation angle, this reflected signal in red is a longer path than the direct signal. The direct and reflected signal are going to interfere. You're going to get some kind of interference pattern from that. Sometimes it'll be constructive interference. Sometimes it'll be destructive. That pattern of in interference is what I'm going to be using. And this is multipath. It's, it's uh, been around forever. The two things I can tell you from this technique are how high the antenna is above the planar surface. And I can tell you something about the kind of surfaces it is. Is it wet? Is it dry? What kind of surfaces? Is, uh, bare soil is different than, say, snow. So it's uh, basically GPS as a radar. So I also wanted to at least show you the observables we use. Um, <clears throat> geodesists use carrier phase data. Navigation people use pseudo range. Um, I use signal power data. This is a typical time series for uh, signal power or signal to noise ratio. I'm showing you a single satellite track for a site in Boulder, Colorado. It's six hours long on the x-axis. The, the boring normal power signal is shown in black. That's the part I don't care about. What's shown in red is a real signal. And if I take the black part out by doing some kind of polynomial fit, you see I have these two sine waves. These are those interference patterns I was talking about. The frequency of the interference pattern tells me that height of the antenna above the reflecting surface. And the, and the amplitudes, for the most part, tell us the kind of surface it is. So that's the data I'm using. It's quite different than what geodesists use, but it's the same instrument. So I'm going to just jump in and assume you want to know environmental signals uh, without motivating why you'd want to do that. But why would you want to do it with a GPS receiver? Well, you'd want to supplement other sensors. Uh, many uh, environmental sensors have small footprints, a meter by a meter, some only a few centimeters by a few centimeters. Many satellites measure the same kinds of parameters, but they have very large footprints, kilometers, tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers. As I said before, I can use instruments uh, installed by, by geodesists, which makes the data inexpensive. And uh, you need in situ sensors for uh, satellite validation and assimilation. So our first um, result that some of you are aware of was measuring soil moisture for the site in Boulder, Colorado. We started in 2007, what's shown in the time series in dark blue with these uh, bars, that's just precipitation. It's a reality check that it rained on those days and how much it rained. What's shown in the gray region is the range of five uh, water sensors, uh, soil moisture sensors that were actually buried in the soil. What's shown in the colors are different GPS satellites and you can see that those are very highly aligned. So the correlation coefficient of something like 0.9. So this was our first demonstration that said, you know, hey, maybe I can use this GPS antenna right here as a radar to do soil moisture. We followed that up by uh, showing that we could measure snow the next year and vegetation water content the next year. And once we had algorithms that allowed us to derive those quantities uh, regularly or quickly, 
uh, we asked if we could start our own water sensor network called PBOH2O. Uh, we were planning to use the Plate Boundary Observatory, which uh, the locations of the uh, CONUS sites are shown in cyan. Uh, of course, the purpose of the Plate Boundary Observatory had nothing to do with water sensing, but um, and it was supposed to measure these deformation rates shown on the right, uh, but it was a beautiful network uh, with outstanding equipment, and uh, it was an opportunity. So um, in 2012, in the fall, I believe it was, we started our first results. We only had 25 stations. Um, we measured soil moisture every day. Uh, it was not a real-time network. It was near real-time. We posted these every morning. The kind of quality of these uh, data is shown here. This is a site in eastern New Mexico. We measured very shallow soil moisture, which is shown in the blue dots here. Uh, if there was a MET sensor, we provided that data to people, not because we used it in the algorithm, just but as a reality check. We also downloaded and provided to the community NLDAS precipitation records, again, to give context to these records. Um, ultimately, as we optimized our, our algorithms and also our um, quality control, we were able to do this for 150 sites in the Western US. We also measured snow depth originally, and ultimately we then uh, improved our algorithms to also provide snow water equivalent because that was requested. We did this at about 220 sites. I'm gonna show you one in, uh, 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 excuse me, in um, Idaho. Uh, here is just a single year where we uh, validated the GPS retrievals of snow depth by taking uh, a photograph with a camera of a pole and digitized those numbers. Very good agreement in this particular year. But once you have the algorithms, uh, we were able to develop climate records for that site. So PBOH2O began here in 2012. We ran it as a network for almost six years. But we also, once we had the algorithms, went back and analyze the data starting at the beginning of the Plate Boundary Observatory. And you might have noticed that there were sites in Minnesota. Uh, that's not part of the Plate Boundary Observatory, but it is a source of um, free data. The Department of Transportation in Minnesota provides it, so I added it just so that there'd be snow data for people in Minnesota. Um, we also measured um, vegetation water content changes. I, I've left out the details. I'll just give you a big, broad view of it. Um, again, we take advantage of the fact that PBO was a crustal deformation experiment that lasted for over a decade to look at vegetation changes over nine years in this case. Um, just basically the story is that if it was an extra wet year, uh, it's dark blue. If it's an average year of vegetation, it's shown in cyan. And if it was really red, that was drought. And you can see the development of the very significant three-year drought in California between 2012 and 2014. But you can also see there was a very significant drought in 2007 as well. So this was all, we, we did ground experiments to validate our algorithms. We published papers on how we did it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after we had PBOH2O going, I worked with some other colleagues to do some other applications. So they weren't explicitly part of PBOH2O. We were able to measure tides at this site that Jeff Freimuller installed to measure crustal deformation rates. The distinctive thing here is that this is a, because this is a GPS sensor, it's measuring water levels in ITRF. So that will mean something to the geodesist. This is not the best tide gauge, but it is the only one that measures in ITRF by its very nature. Uh, this happens to be in Alaska. I just wanna, I showed you that data earlier. This is the kind of data we use for a rising and setting GPS satellite in Boulder, the antenna there is about two meters tall. And the frequency here is very similar to the frequency here because, you know, the antenna surface didn't change in the six hours uh, when the satellite was in view. This is Jeff Freimuller's site. Uh, this is what a data looked like, excuse me, when you have a very significant tidal signal. So he has this very high frequency signal here and a lower frequency low tide, high tide. You don't have to do one value, you can do multiple per day, excuse me, per track. This was our initial results. This is a two week period for that time, uh, for that place. There was a tide gauge about 30 kilometers away. Richard Ray did the comparisons between the two. And you can see here on the Y axis, sea level, this is plus or minus eight meters and the GPS can very reliably retrieve sea level there in ITRF. Um, 
We then went back, Richard, uh, Richard Ray, myself, um, also Simon Williams, and looked at a longer time series uh, at Friday Harbor, Washington. There, there was a co-located tight gauge. And Richard was interested not just in how well it agreed with daily averages over a year, where that was better than two centimeters, but also the 10-year record where the RMS difference was 1.3 centimeters. Now, this was early days of reflectometry where we only used GPS signals. And I'll talk later about what you can do with the new signals. I also was motivated um, by some, well, I don't know what you want to call it. I saw that there were GPS receivers running in the middle of the Greenland ice sheet. <laughs> like, I couldn't figure out, I mean, I knew why. They were there to measure ice sheet motion, but um, they intrigued me. And um, the data were archived at UNAVCO. I worked with John Moore on this. Uh, this is what the site looked like. Uh, the antenna was buried beneath the ice. Uh, it was about three and a half meters tall. When they installed it, this was 2011, and this is the Iris Tech. Um, ultimately, we were able to measure snow accumulation there uh, for almost nine years. Uh, just point out to you, a very large melt occurred in 2012, but there's you know smaller melts each summer. Uh, this is an accumulation zone. First question you have is, well, is that very big melt real? Well, we have some photographs anyway. You can see that when they installed it, the monument was flushed with the uh, snow ice surface, 2012. Yes, in fact, there had been very significant melt. We can do better than just photographs. Uh, thanks to uh, the late Connie Stefan, who provided a pinger to compare with our results. And also um, Michael McFerrin gave us one of his pinger records. So it's accurate. Uh, it was uh, in situ data for free, basically, because it had been installed to measure ice sheet speeds. Some newer things I've been doing uh, since, uh, well, since last year, uh, I noticed there'd been a large earthquake in the Schumigans, and I'd always been interested in possibly trying to detect tsunami waves, but you know, you, uh, there'd been no event that I thought I could do that. Um, we used a GPS site that had been installed for the Plate Boundary Observatory. Uh, if, you, uh, if you know the region of the star is the location, You'll notice it, it's not on a it's not on a um, a dock. It's 70 meters above sea level, so you can do this technique from quite a height. Um, most people would recognize the value of these data to measure coast seismic displacements. This happens to be a vertical displacement of about 35 centimeters. Uh, it's a tide gauge. Here I'm using GPS data to measure tides before and after this um, tsunami. We don't have uh, in situ records to compare with, but there is this uh, tsunami model put together by Thornley and his colleagues at the University of Hawaii, also from China and Japan, and it had about a 30 centimeter uh, amplitude near my site, not my site, our site. Uh, what's shown in gray are the tsunami uh, wave models, and what are shown in blue and uh, green are the GPS estimates. So there's good agreement between um, what could be a real-time GPS system and tsunami models for this earthquake. A few weeks later, Hurricane Laura hit. I thought, well, let's go see if there's a GPS site near there. In fact, not just GPS, there's GNSS. So again, that's the generic term. Uh, that means that not only tracks GPS, it tracks the European system, which is called Galileo, the Russian system, which is called GLONASS. Uh, it's on a Sentinel, uh, on a canal. There's a NOAA tide gauge. And also there's a wind sensor there. So we knew from some previous work that you can measure storm surges with GPS, but here we had all the in-situ measurements to really demonstrate to people that we could do it. Um, so here I'm showing the record of the GPS retrieval compared to the tide gauge, which is in blue. You can see the time series is very much filled in, and that's because we have multiple constellations, which is the best way to do this. And you can also see that it operated during these high speeds particularly here when the speeds went down as the eye crossed over uh, the site. It happened to be in the eye of the hurricane. So as the wind speeds went down, we were able to get the peak. It does not work very well above 30 meters per second. So tide gauge during Hurricane Laura. Um, I, now I want to spend about five minutes talking about how we did all this. Well, how did we do this in basically from 2007 to 2017? I want to acknowledge my colleagues. These were 
Um, the primary colleagues and students I work with basically all brilliant and contributed in a lot of different ways to making this all work. Um, I also want to talk about serendipity a little bit. Uh, Jay Fine was our program manager and happened to come to my Bowie lecture, which I think helped him see what we were up to. Uh, Dara Antakabi was the PI for SMAP. SMAP was very important in supporting the development of this technique. Uh, we succeeded because we had data from the Plate Boundary Observatory. And Barack Obama, I will just say, uh, this technique was developed as the stimulus funding hit uh, the NSF. So even though we weren't funded with stimulus funds, certainly it helped that that new money was available to um, support new ideas. So where are we today? Well, uh, PBOH20 was funded originally in 2012. It was renewed. We operated it through the end of 2017. Um, we were very careful to archive our work at, um, uh, at places where people could find the data, soil moisture, uh, archive in Europe and the National Snow and, Snow and Ice Data Center here in the US. Uh, Mike Willis hosted our, is hosting our archived website. And, and we were very fortunate that NASA agreed to port all of our code uh, from PBOH to so it could be run by JPL. It isn't being run now, but they do have the code if they wish to turn it on. Um, and I would say, well, People, I continue to get emails about soil moisture. Really, it's the cryosphere and oceanographic applications that people are a little bit more interested in now. So here are my other thoughts. I only have about three minutes to go. I think that NSF and NASA do a great job of supporting PI-driven research. And this is an example of some of that. Uh, you know, you have an idea, you write a proposal, you write papers, you develop algorithms. But at the same time, some agencies are driven by missions. And a lot of the ones that you know, help our communities are driven by missions. And sometimes the PI-driven research doesn't get to those agencies. Um, I'd be curious to know what people think about how to get new ideas to an operational agency. It's very difficult in my view. Um, I think, and this is not just geodetic facilities, uh, same problem with seismic facilities when I tried to archive my uh, GPS seismology results, they're supportive, but you're not really what they do. So they're not quite sure what to do with you. And, and that can make it difficult. It's just a generic rant. No one reads the literature. I, I cannot tell you how many times I get emails from people that tell me they've discovered something that we published in 2013. Um, so it drives me nuts, um, but I don't have a solution for that. And I'd say a little bit, uh, that success is a double-edged sword for a PI-driven research like this, because if you really succeed, it means an operational agency should take it over. And if they don't, what does that mean? So how are you going to make your work available to people? Are you going to keep analyzing the data? That's what we did for PBOH20, and I think it was a good model for that, because it was a network. If you're going to provide code to people, how bulletproof are you going to make that code? And resources are limited. Uh, it's a lot different to write a PI proposal for 100K a year and uh, versus operational proposals. So uh, I retired. Um, Matt didn't mention I retired from my faculty position. So I've been thinking about how to make this kind of work available to people. Um, a lot of people don't want to know what you're doing. They just want the results. And I call that the Amazon experience. So because I'm semi-retired, I decided to teach myself how to make a web app. Um, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. I had to teach myself Python and Flask and JavaScript, and I will not say more, but it, it does reflect tree on demand. You can see examples, you can analyze data from the archives, and you can um, upload your own data. And it returns the results both in a graphical form with helpful links and photographs, but if you just want the numbers, it gives you the numbers. But there are other people, particularly or scientists, people that might be on this phone call or Zoom call, they, they might be willing to run the code themselves. They might not be interested in all the details, but if you make it easy for them to use, I think they're more likely to use it. I just have one or two more slides. So if I'm getting a, a reminder to stop, I will. So we have started an open source Python project. It's currently on my website. It's being supported by NASA. 
and it will support and already does support snow and water levels. We're going to add soil moisture. So it's there, it's on PIP, and UNAVCO is going to make Jupyter notebooks for the community. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. So it's a different way of providing the data to the community. You can analyze all the data or not, but this is another way of reaching people. So I just wanna say uh, my hope that by helping to build this open source software, I'm going to be able to engage the community in a different way, not the way we were doing in PBOH2O, but also the community that needs the, the software to make this happen. And I will stop there. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Uh, we have a couple minutes for a question and I think uh, Jeff Freimuller has a question. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Great talk. And uh, I w wondered if you might be able to say a few words about how you got from the, hey, we can measure this thing with our GPS to here is a product that people want to have, right? I mean, so this, you, your, your work is a great example of, of uh, things that started out in this sort of curiosity based and was turned into a product that was beneficial to other communities. And how did you work with hydrologists and others to, you know, to really kind of focus the work and refine things so that you're producing the, the products that they wanted? Um, I would mostly, um, well, it was a big team experience, but I, I'm gonna particularly point to Eric Small. He was, he's quote, our hydrologist, and uh, he knew what hydrologists wanted, and he made sure we provided it. Um, I always remember him, I, well, no, I won't tell that story. Anyway, he's a great colleague. I would also, uh, again, reference Dara Endakabi and SMAP, uh, they were looking for data. They told us exactly the kind of data they needed. We weren't the only people providing data, but it made, we had very clear goals for how accurate we were gonna make that data. Um, we had a lot of support, I will admit as well. We had a lot of support from uh, NASA because they wanted SNAP to be a success and they wanted people like ourselves providing data. NSF was interested for providing soil moisture data in general. Um, so I think if you want to make your, your data products, if you, a geodesist, solid earth geophysicist, want to make your data products available to these new communities, you have to have someone on your team from that community. And Eric Small played that role, um, I would say, yeah. And for tide gauges, for example, uh, you know, I found myself trying to estimate tide, tidal coefficients in a hotel room in Sweden while I was jet lagged once or something, you know, like you're up in the middle of the night. And then I was like, why am I doing this? Richard Ray is like a world expert. I'll work with Richard Ray. So they're, again, working with the expert in tides is to me a better use of my time. I'll work on the algorithms and, and let the experts um, do the um, analysis that vets the product. Another example would be Matt Siegfried and um, David Sheen. Uh, they used this technique on ice sheets. And you know, they're cryosphere scientists, I'm not. And they're the ones who make sure that the results make sense. Long-winded answer, I hope that was okay. Thanks, it's actually very helpful. Thanks, Christine. We do have uh, one quick question here from Rosemary Knight um, that I'll ask you before we move on. And All her right. question was, um, how large was the gap in time and funding between having code that was great for your group to use? Um, oh, somebody. Should I turn my um, presentation off? I'm not even sure how to do it. Sorry, uh, to repeat the question, um, how large was the gap in time and funding between having code that was great for your group to use, as you called it, bulletproof code? I'm not sure I'm there yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I was doing pretty well, uh, Rosemary, and I talked to a new colleague a few years ago and he told me, I mean, I think I had code that a grad student could run at that time. And he told me, no, I needed to make it so the code could be run by an 18 year old work study. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> that's quite the bar there. So, um, but you know, I'm there. I, I, I'm there for snow and water levels. I'm not there yet for soil moisture. We have put that last because soil moisture is by far the hardest thing to do and we wanna make it bulletproof. 
So I don't know, how long did it take me? Well, that's hard to say because I had to teach myself Python. And also this was, you know, I think we've written this code three or four times. Uh, I don't know, two or three years. I, I've been doing it part-time, so I don't know that I have a good answer, but it, I, I, I'm getting better at writing it. I will say that. It's a little faster each time. Great, thanks so much, Christine. And thanks to all of you who asked questions. We will come back to those at the end of Sarah's talk. So why don't we uh, ramp over to have Sarah get ready. Um, so I'm glad to introduce our next speaker, which is Sarah Cruz, who is a faculty member at the University of South Florida, um, where she leads the Near Surface Geophysics Research Group uh, since the year 1996. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from MIT um, in tectonophysics, and also has been a faculty member at Eckerd College and the College of William and Mary. So we're very excited uh, for Sarah to be our next speaker. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Matt. Can you see the slide? Yes, it looks good. Okay, so I'm Sarah Krista from the University of South Florida, and I'm going to follow um, as Christine did um, and talk about research that's active today and also how we could move forward most effectively within the future with this in the future. And I'm going to give a little bit more of an overview talk. Um, near surface geophysics is a very broad field and assume that just try to give some examples to a general audience. Okay, so what do we mean by near surface geophysics? The top few hundred meters of the earth. Um, and so near surface geophysics differs primarily from solid earth geophysics in the sense that we actually have more tools available, instruments that can sense important parameters in the top hundred meters, but that don't penetrate to greater depths. So I'm going to give some examples of science being done now with these near surface geophysical methods applied to cryosphere problems, groundwater hydrology, volcanic hazards, make a point about how this field can fill critical gaps in measurement scales, and also how we can apply it to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Alongside these examples, I'm going to make suggestions about what we could do if we had more resources directed towards near surface geophysics and, for example, a near surface geophysics center. And the reason I bring this up is because in the recent CORE's Earth and Time report, they recommended the funding of a national near surface geophysics center. So I would point out that we are all familiar with the value of national facilities like IRIS, UNAVCO, CTEMPS. In terms of cyber infrastructure, we have QUASI and Open Topo. These provide incredibly useful uh, tools for collaboration. 30 years ago, if you wanted to do an experiment with an ocean bottom seismometer, you had to be affiliated with Woods Hole or some other oceanographic institution. Now anyone in the United States can write a proposal to, for an experiment using ocean bottom seismometers. We do not have something similar for the use of near surface geophysical equipment and expertise in the United States right now. So I'm going to borrow more from this CORES report. They propose 12 important questions to be addressed in the next decade. And they point out that seven of these questions near surface geophysics could make significant contributions. So I'm going to use this alongside my slides as a framework for illustrating the sort of fundamental science importance of much of this work. I've shortened the questions up, but I'll point out for the different studies where they're relevant to these key critical questions. So what can your surface geophysics do? We have a suite of instruments that we can use. Now the solid earth geophysicists in the audience will be very familiar with seismics and gravity and magnetics. But there are a number of other methods, mostly but not all electrical, that penetrate near surface depths that allow us to widely expand this toolbox to look at a range of geological processes. So these methods include ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity tomography, electromagnetic methods, which is our sort of near surface version of MT, nuclear magnetic resonance, induced polarization, 
and self-potential. So I want to point out that the discipline of near-surface geophysics isn't just a box of equipment on different kinds of equipment on a shelf. It is how do you use these data? How, what can we actually map in terms of earth materials from these physical measurements? What are the uncertainties and what we can say about earth materials and processes? How do we integrate these methods and invert the data for the, the parameters that we're interested in? So it's a huge field with an enormous amount of intellectual capital addressed at resolving these critical questions with these tools. So I'm going to start my talk with an example, a couple of examples from the cryosphere. So and I'm going to focus these examples on the issue of permafrost. Permafrost melting causes infrastructure damage and all sorts of uh, other changes associated with climate change. There are a number of fundamental questions that we can look at using near surface geophysics um, in regards to the cryosphere. So a couple of these, like the first one, how does liquid water affect snow, glacier, and permafrost dynamics? And the fourth one, what is the distribution and thickness of ice rich permafrost deposits? So the first study I'll show is an example addressing these questions with both ground penetrating radar and nuclear magnetic resonance. So this study from Terry and co-authors integrates GPR and NMR data to look at permafrost thaw processes. The background image is a ground penetrating radar profile. GPR is great because it provides high resolution stratigraphy and detailed imaging of contacts in the subsurface. The problem is that the GPR radar response reflects the integrated matrix and water composition of the earth material. And if we want to fully interpret this in terms of cryosphere processes, we want to know where the liquid water is. And this is where the NMR comes in. The NMR, when it's set out, can provide a depth profile of the total water content in other in the different layers, which lets us essentially calibrate our GPR image to answer cryosphere problems. So this integration is really important for the science. So with these green boxes, I'm trying to show what maybe we could do better in the future. So ground penetrating radar systems cost between 50 and 100K and are relatively widely available because there are a lot of commercial applications. But NMR is a much more specialized and much more expensive equipment, starts above 300,000. And there are actually very few researchers in the United States that have access to NMR equipment. So this key component of the integrated study is really only accessible at present to a few researchers. The next example I want to show is a study that combines electrical resistivity tomography and self potential methods to address cryospheric issues. The, uh, this paper by uh, Wojtek et al, they're identifying hydrologic flow processes in Arctic hill slopes. And the figure on the bottom shows the results of re earth resistivity profiles. The blue zones are wetter soil zones. But the beauty of combining the resistivity data with the self potential data is that self potential data is sensitive to flow, groundwater flow, while the resistivity is sensitive to the presence of groundwater. So by combining the two data sets, you can learn about both where the water is and where the water is moving. So what could we do, for example, for studies like this? Well, self-potential electrodes tend to be pretty flaky, and especially for long-term monitoring. We want to understand better their responses, and we would like perhaps to develop more robust electrodes. So here's an example of where equipment development could really help us out. I'm going to turn now to a couple of examples from groundwater hydrology. The examples that uh, I'm going to show address two profoundly important questions. The first is saltwater intrusion in coastal aquifers. And if there are any coastal water managers in the audience, they recognize how critically important this issue is. 
The second is important to all of us who eat food. Um, and it's related to subsidence from groundwater withdrawal for agricultural purposes and how we have to balance that against our food security needs. So both of these studies that I'm going to show come from Rosemary Knight's environmental geophysics group at Stanford. The first study uses electrical resistivity tomography. The second study uses airborne electromagnetics. So the first study is remarkable because it's a watershed scale study. This is a resistivity study collected along the coast of Monterey Bay in California. So the water is out in our front. We're looking at the land in the background. And this is a resistivity profile spanning almost 40 kilometers of the coastline to 300 meters depth. Reds show zones of salt water. Blue show zones of fresh water. And the important thing here is the saltwater intrusion pattern is much more complex than one might expect from the simple where are the locations of river inputs. So we have a lot to learn about saltwater intrusion and management on the watershed scale. The next example is in the Central Valley of California, which is uh, responsible for a massive amount of the US uh, food production. So this slide shows INSAR data collected between January 2015 and September 2019. Over this approximately four year interval, the zones shown in red subsided up to 1.3 meters. Blue indicates little subsidence, red maximum subsidence. This remarkable subsidence is related to overpumping and the decline in water levels. The subsidence itself has an impact on infrastructure, including the aqueducts that move the surface water. So to deal with this combined issue of subsidence and yet the need to grow food in this valley, Rosemary Knight's group collected airborne electromagnetic data along these white lines shown in right in this area in the southern central valley of maximum subsidence. And the results are remarkable. On the aquifer scale, the airborne electromagnetics, and this is only a subset of the data, show us at low resistivities the presence of clays, higher resistivity zones that represent sand and gravel. Now this image, these profiles were ac actually rep they're representative of the material below the ground surface, but they're plotted just above the ground surface. They, the images show inner fingerings of, of clay layers. These are important because groundwater pumping produces compaction in these clay layers, which contributes to the subsidence. And most significantly, on this scale, you can identify zones of natural recharge. You could identify um, zones of that would be good sites for managed recharge. You could identify zones where pumping would cause minimal amounts of subsidence. So watershed scale mapping can answer critical questions about water management. So how could we do even better than these remarkable data sets? Well, one thing is that in terms of electrical resistivity tomography, many researchers acquire data in, in different ways. I think the community needs some data quality metrics or some idea about how we can characterize the noise and uncertainty in these data sets. We also need open source software that would help us with experiment design. In terms of the electromag airborne electromagnetic data, we need an accessible repository for these large data sets so that other researchers can access and work with this data. I'm going to move on to uh, an example of near surface geophysics being applied to volcanic hazards. This the hazard I'm going to focus on are hazards associated with eruption explosivity and ash plumes. And the photo in the upper right shows a Icelandic volcano erupting. This is not the eruption this week, but one that you may recall from 2010, and I won't even dare to try to pronounce the volcano name. But this eruption produced 
um, a massive ash plume, and you may recall, that closed down airports in Europe for many days in 2010. And the map in the bottom shows the ash plume in this the red cloud, and the blue dots show the locations of airports where flights were canceled at the moment of this screen snapshot um, from the internet. So here are some science questions we can uh, try to address with near surface geophysics in regards to volcanic hazards. I'll talk about the top one, do eruption and transport models explain the distribution of ash deposits from violent eruptions? And for example, the bottom one, could expansion of the monitoring toolkit we use improve our ability to do eruption forecasting? So the study I'll show is one we did with ground penetrating radar. And we did it on a small basaltic cinder cone in Nicaragua called Cerro Negro. And Cerro Negro is important because it's just northeast of the city of Leon, which is the second largest city in Nicaragua. And the prevailing winds carry ash from eruptions of Cerro Negro over the city of Leon. Of Leon. And Cerro Negro has erupted some 23 times since 1850. So what we would really like to understand in terms of its eruptive history in order to make hazard forecasts and design plans for this area is whether eruptions are more likely to produce massive plumes like this photo from the 1968 eruption or distinguish those from eruptions that produce smaller amounts of material that may just flow or roll down the flanks of the cinder cone itself and not affect Leon. So one way we can do this is by using ground penetrating radar on the flanks of the volcano. And I realize this figure may not project well through zoom, but you can see schematically in the upper right of these figures, we illustrate what the radar data show. And on parts of the cone, we can see clearly that layers truncate against older deposits out in the plain surrounding the cinder cone. So this must be material that flowed or avalanched down the side of the slope and then stopped at the toe. Other parts of the cone, we image strata that continue continuously below the surface, well out onto the flanks and out onto the plain of the volcano. Such material would have been deposited from high ash plumes stretching out into the horizon. So we can distinguish material deposited from, from high, high ash plumes from those from lower energetic parts of eruptions or events. Oh, this work is from Cortland et al. Distinguishing deposits of low energy and high energy scoria eruptions. Okay, so how could we do better? Well, GPR profiles give us the thickness of these volcanic deposits. But the hazard assessors who are modeling the ash plumes are actually interested in a different quantity. They want the kilogram per meter squared of ash that has landed on the surface because that is what their models account for and forecast. So to convert a layer thickness into the mass of ash contained in that layer, we need to know the porosity of the layer. And GPR is unfortunately or fortunately, depending on the science you want to do, highly de dependent on the water content of the material. In order to try to get at the porosity of the layer, we need to correct for the water content. To correct for the water content, we need other methods, maybe NMR or seismics. And we can do this better if we have access to um, state-of-the-art multi-offset GPR systems. So this is an example of a problem where we could go from the geophysics more directly to the physical parameter of interest to the hazard modelers if we could integrate methods, if we had broader access to equipment. Okay, the next point I want to make is that near surface geophysics can fill critical gaps in measurement scales. This figure comes from Berkmansley at the USGS. He's plotted on the vertical axis the depth of investigation and on the horizontal axis the spatial coverage of the dip methods. And this afternoon we'll hear about GRACE results in the upper right. GRACE can give us information about properties deep in the earth but only on very large length scales. 
Well, the gold uh, standard of understanding the Earth perhaps comes from borehole data, direct measurements, and borehole data can give us information to depth, but only at the spot in which the borehole was drilled. So there's enormous gaps in these scales of observations that can be filled with both ground and airborne geophysics. An example of using near surface geophysics to connect the gaps between what some of these scales is a study where remote sensing data were validated by near surface geophysical data collected on the ground. This is a study by Schaefer et al, where they uh, verified measurements of permafrost thickness determined from remote sensing data by collecting data within the satellite footprint on the ground. Another example of scale gaps that can be filled by near surface geophysics comes is seen in this plot from Stephen Moisey. He plots the on the horizontal axis, we again have the spatial scale of the process or the measurement, but on the vertical axis now we're looking at the temporal scale of the process. And we can image processes over a range of temporal scales from fractions of seconds to multiple years with logging sensors in the ground, but these are limited to the single point of installation. If we want to image and in, get information about all of these processes that fall in this larger space with larger scales of measurements and longer temporal periods, we either need networks of sensors or geophysical monitoring. So example of this is a 2D time lapse resistivity survey that was collected after the BP oil spill on a remote coast in Louisiana. And these are resistivity profiles collected perpendicular to the shoreline. The top one, oh, and this is work by, uh, published by Heenan et al. in 2014. The top profile shows the resistivity data collected seven days after the BP oil spill. Th this is the resistivity to about two meters depth along a 25 meter profile. The bottom profile shows what the resistivity of the terrain looked like 152 days after the oil spill. So what we are looking at is the natural attenuation of the oil in the sediments after this spill. So really useful studies like this, though, are hard to translate at present into studies that require 3D coverage in complex terrain, sometimes to test our conceptual models of what's happening, for example, in a critical zone study here, we need data on different scales and in three dimensions. Airborne EM is quite expensive. Resistivity systems require cabling that can make them very impractical to deploy in complex environments. So here's a potential example of instrumentation of the future. This example comes from a white paper submitted by Slater and Zhang to the NSF in a call for uh, public comments last summer. So this example shows what we could do on a remote hillside in which it would be difficult to install cabled sensors. You can uh, put in electrodes that have a uh, uh, clocks that are calibrated with GPS and drive current in selected electrodes with uh, a specific waveform of current injection and record the potential, the voltages measured at other electrodes that you've installed in the ground. So if this looks like a seismic nodal array, it's because it would be. It would be like an active seismic nodal experiment where some of the nodes can function as sources. This would be an absolute game changer for near surface geophysics and all these studies that benefit from imaging the resistivity of the subsurface. So we finish in one minute. Okay, uh, we'll jump forward. We need community input into instrument development. So one last point, 
Uh, the CORES report recommends that we should improve diversity, equity, inclusion in the geosciences. Most students have their first encounter with hands-on geophysics with near-surface geophysics. Studies show that this first encounter can be transformative. When you collect data of your own that has meaning to you on a relevant project, it encourages you to stay in science. This is a picture of a student from Dickinson College collecting ground penetrating radar data over unmarked graves in an African American cemetery. But most institutions lack access to even basic geophysical instrumentation, especially institutions without large endowments. We need broader access, we need training for instructors and students, and we need teaching materials. So in conclusion, I've just tried to show examples of applications of near surface geophysics to a number of different fields. I want to stress that these are a small set of what I could, I could have spoken for hours and hours, that we can address a whole range of problems with a whole range of instrumentations and the methods to use them. Near surface science would be accelerated by investments in broader access to high resolution to sorry both basic and high end equipment and training. I think transformative research will involve integrated methods and multi scale data. We'll need new methods and equipment development we will need new techniques machine learning and inversion to deal with very large data sets. We need open source software, we need data quality metrics, we need data repositories to do this important transformative work. I want to thank all the people that contributed to this presentation. I won't say their names out loud, but it was really a community effort. Many of the ideas presented here came from these people. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a great overview with so many great examples. Um, I uh, don't see a question for you at the moment, unless someone can uh, point me to one. But I will, so I'll go to the Q and A, where we'll sort of start with some questions. Um, and uh, maybe this one is for you, Sarah. I don't know. And it's it's a question um, that asks: Is remote sensing sensing technically possible to measure part per billion or uh, low levels of groundwater and drinking water pollution from heavy metals and PFAS. Is there a technique that we have that we can do this? Uh, parts per billion of, of what? Sorry, this is, it says for PBB and PPT level groundwater and drinking water pollution. Okay, it depends on the kind of pollution. So if the contaminants um, are higher conductivity or lower conductivity than the background groundwater, we do extremely well at sensing these kind of contaminant plumes. If the, um, because many of these near surface techniques exploit that uh, measure, are measuring basically the conductivity of the ground. Uh, so the answer is some yes, some no. Yes, and, and I see Rosemary Knight has put in the question and answer. She says uh, possible yes with NMR if the contaminant is absorbed to the solid. Yes. Thanks, Great. Rosemary. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. Um, all right, so we have about 15 minutes left in this session. And so I'm going to use this as a chance to open it up to any general questions that anyone has for either of our speakers or for the topics that they have raised. Um, we have a couple of questions here in the chat that I think will get us off to a good start here. One is from Matt Fouch, and his question is, um, research to operations seems to be a critical gap across a number of areas, not just NSF funded work. I know the NASA disasters program focuses heavily on this approach. Are there parallel efforts within NSF that could leverage this approach, not only with GNSS uh, IR data, but also other types of geophysical data in a more unified way. So if either of you want to take a chance at stab at that, um, that sounds like a good question. Um, I guess I feel like I certainly NSF could, maybe they could do more to help people like myself get things into operational research. But um, I would say NASA has programs for doing that. Um, already, as you noted, but they, I will say that as a GPS person, NASA can't quite decide if they like GPS 
I'll just say that because we're not a NASA satellite. Um, so it's a problem. I mean, um, if it were a NASA satellite product, maybe it would be looked on differently by NASA, for example. Is that okay to say? I, <laughs> um, we could pick on another agency, I guess. NOAA is not one of your sponsors. Is that right, um, Matt? No, NOAA is not, but they, um, there might they be might some people. Be on, they might be on the call, but so, uh, you know, NOAA is another operational agency. Uh, what are they doing to take on these <laughs> new discoveries in um, solid earth geophysics? I mean, how do you make that happen, right? Because they're an important part of our um, community for hydrogeodesy. I mean, they need soil moisture data, they need snow data. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, it's a problem that I, and I don't think NSF is really the problem. I think uh, maybe they could enable more discussion with these operational agencies. Perhaps. Great. All right. We have a couple more questions here for you, Christine. Um, one is from Dinesh. He asks, um, I'm working with soil moisture data with GNSS IR, and I'm having difficulty finding in situ data for data validation. Where could we find in situ data? Well, I guess my, the question would be, did you put in your own sites? I mean, are you trying to do this without having your own data, right? So we put in our own sensors. Uh, no one would believe us if we didn't go out and make our own measurements. And that's why working with hydrologists was so important. Uh, similarly, for snow depth and SWE, we had to do our own validation. Um, but if you're looking for other soil moisture data, there is a US climate reference network. And possibly you could put a GPS site near there if you wanted to have a reliable source of data, if, if that helps. I, does that help? Like, that's great, Christine. Thank you. All right, here's another one for you. Um, this is from Yang Du. Um, could you talk about the limits of the GPS retrievals for soil moisture, vegetation, water cover, water content, and SWE, and the next generations on overcoming those limitations? Um, the limitations for uh, retrievals of soil moisture are the same that we started with. It's a surface, very shallow. Uh, either you're not interested in that or you are. It was perfect for SMAP, but I can't tell you what's going on a meter deep, right? So it's a very shallow surface soil moisture. For vegetation water content, the limitations, it, um, it could use some more terrain modeling to perhaps get the unit set. Right now it's a normalized quantity. And for snow depth, it's really the same problem for uh, soil moisture. I need planar surfaces. So if you plan to put your GPS site in a forest surrounded by tall trees, it isn't going to work. So you need to be uh, sensitive to, I mean, I, we, we set up validation sites and people wanted to put the GPS in the middle of this field. And I said, no, no, put it in the north so I can get some nice southern planar surfaces. So know when your technique will work and won't work. That's why I love the ice sheets because they're just empty. <laughs> There's no people. There's, you know, occasionally they'll have a tent. But um, the ice sheets are a very good place to use this technique because no roads, no cars, no parking lots, and things like that. So those are kind of the limitations. And the near surface geophysics can expand your spatial coverage and tell you <laughs> something about the moisture a meter down. <laughs> well, I would also say, you know, in 20 minutes, I couldn't begin to talk about what I do and the people that weigh the water. People are doing some very exciting things where they use GPS and INSAR to essentially weigh the effect of water. Look at, you know, Hurricane Harvey, uh, just look at loading from snow and from soil moisture. Um, if you want to talk about deeper sources of water, you can use other kinds of geodetic data. And that would be another talk right there, right? But, but just beyond that. Um, and I think those techniques have a lot of promise because they're not limited like mine, where I have to have planar surfaces. Um, theirs is a weight. They're weighing the effect of the load of that water on the crust. And so 
I, I think they give a, a bigger view of what's going on perhaps in a watershed that might be more useful to hydrologists. There's a tension, I think, some people don't care about in situ data. They want the big picture. They want the satellite to tell them what's going on, but you need both kinds of data. And that's what Sarah's saying. You need different temporal and spatial scales and one instrument's not gonna do it all for you, most likely. Great, thank you, Christine. All right, I think this question is for both of you, but maybe Sarah can take the first step from Justin Sweet. And he has a question that says, I'm interested in the implications of facility support raised uh, by both speakers. Christine mentioned issues with facilities needing to accept data outside their domain and comfort zone. Sarah mentioned the lack of a national facility for near, near service geophysics. I would love to hear thoughts from both speakers on what they would like to see in terms of geophysical facility support for PI science in the future and how they see that support impacting the science PIs are able to do. Well, I'd like Iris not to add instrument responses to GPS positions when they archive my data. That would be... <laughs> if there are any seismologists on the call. Uh, that's what I kind of meant out of the comfort zone. I mean, to a seismologist or to a seismology archive, sure, let's add an instrument response. <laughs> but to those of us who are geodesists, position is position. There ain't no instrument response. So uh, these kind of, um, you know, when you're talking to people in a different field, uh, you can easily make these kind of mistakes. And when I was working with hydrologists, you know, I banned local time. I don't, you know, and I told her I never ever want to hear about local time again. There's GPS time and we will all live, you know, in GPS UTC time. And they looked at me funny, you know, and, and, and um, you know, the person who's trying to find um, in situ data, I feel your pain. I spent years <laughs> trying to find environmental data sets for validation and, and, and it can be difficult when you don't know how the game is played at these facilities. So, Geodesists know how to get data out of geodesy archives, but it can be very, very difficult for non-geodesists. And the same is true when I try to get data out of hydrology archives or seismology archives. So uh, your question though is more, how do we help fix this? I don't know. I mean, I, I have found by making this uh, open source package, I'm trying to make it easier for people not to have to be a geodesy expert to use my technique. I think that one of the reasons people didn't apply this technique is because there was just too much for them to have to learn. They had to learn about orbits and where files were and RINEX files, things they shouldn't have had to do to be a soil moisture sensor. And so if you can write code that, you know, that lowers the barrier, I, I think that's one thing we can do. The facilities, I don't know. Um, you know, they, well, I the, Sorry to interrupt, Christine. Yeah, I mean, no, that's something a facility could help with, right? A facility needs to be much more than, um, you know, a warehouse for equipment. We need the we need to expand the, the user base to people so they can do these integrated studies. And that needs to include training and you know, open source methodology software, just like you're developing. But they don't support it. I mean, you know, I, we are not, my, the, the technique I developed is not supported by any facility. I mean, I'm supporting it. Well, I think Justin's question was aspirational. So yeah. this is our aspirational answer, right? This is, this would the help I do transformative science, right? This is yeah. what, we, this is a kind of thing we need going forward. And I think the, I think the, the question is that, um, I don't think there's any one single answer, right? right? These national facilities are organized in different ways. And I think the fact that for near surface, at least the fact that this, uh, you know, this process is being supported by the CORS report for near surface geophysics. Now, this is the ideal time for the community to gather and think about, okay, what would serve this, you know, multi-method integrated systems approach that we do, mo you know, most well. And it, it probably isn't going to be the exact model of any of the existing facilities, but it's a really exciting time to think about what would work best. I do want to say one nice thing. <laughs> um, uh, when I would have these discussions with hydrologists and we were writing this code, they noticed that I deleted the input files as soon as I used them. So those would be the GPS RINEX files. And the hydrologist was like, why aren't you archiving them? And I'm like, why should I? That's UNAVCO's job. And he was perplexed. So I think UNAVCO and IRIS do an extremely good job 
of making that data available. You don't have to talk to them. It's an FTP command. And so what I was talking about, it's outside their comfort zone. It's like when you go to Iris, but you're giving them something funny, right? And, and, and similarly, you're going to Quasi, but they're not used to what you're doing. So I, I, I agree that maybe these facilities need to be more than just data and equipment areas. I agree. Um, but I, I would also argue that their, their structure, which is, you know, bottom up community governance gives you that opening to go to them and say, look, there's a gap here in what you do. And that yeah. that is a real, I think that's a, one of the good things about these NSF funded facilities is that, you know, some of them are, are really designed for. You're absolutely right. They are the, they are run by their own communities. You're just, it's my only concern is you're outnumbered. That's all. You know, they do a really good job of supporting their main customers. And I, like I said, they do a good job. It's just, they're doing a lot with very little money. And, well, and Christine, this is one of the fundamental problems of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary science, right? right? Is that there's not a single box we fit into. And to even right. do this, we have to get people talking to each other. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. I, um, I yeah. Good. I'm well, we have about three minutes left. And so we're going to the lightning round. Uh, but these are also some very rich questions here. So Sarah, I think uh, since we're talking about the facilities, I'll ask a couple of questions here related to facilities. So uh, there's one question that says, for building a near surface geophysics center in the US, it seems very challenging to handle various types of methods in a single center. How would you envision this challenge? Um, and then another one from Rosemary um, was, in addition to getting the, the near surface equipment and software out there through a central facility, how do you ensure that the equipment and software are correctly used? So maybe um, Sarah, you could talk a little bit about sort of a vision or thoughts about answers these types of questions of how a facility might operate? Yeah, I don't think the template is out there yet. I think this is something that we need to talk about because this is a challenge beyond, for example, what Iris faces. You know, they have seismographs and they have MT systems and ocean bottom seismometers, right? So it's a much more limited equipment pool. So I guess I feel like as one person, I shouldn't say, you know, this is what I would do. And in fact, I'm not sure what I would do. I would want to talk to lots of people. But I do think that we need to ad address the integration of multiple methods as hard as it may be, because that is what's going to move the science forward. Did I weasel out of that? <laughs> well, that was a great lightning round answer to that. <laughs> um, um, I just wanted, I did see a question here about using cheaper GPS sensors. And I'll just say one way to grow this so more people could use GPS or GNSS reflections is to basically use your cell phone or that type of, you know, it's a $5 chip. And, th and that person's absolutely correct. And that might be something that we can do to make uh, it available to more hydrologists use cheaper sensors. Good. And I guess, um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on this question um, from Jorge uh, is sort of how do we make these equipment available not only to students but also to entrepreneurs in a way that could make use uh, for them without facing obstacles? Um, is there a way to involve entrepreneurs in any of this uh, work? Well, I feel like I've seen that Iris interacts with seismograph manufacturers in ways that are you know, productive for both the research community and the commercial manufacturers. And I think this is one thing that's missing from the near surface community is that we don't have an organizational structure that would say, look, you know, there's 50 of us. If, if this piece of equipment got developed, we would all use this, you know, if it was too expensive, but from some shared, you know, facility that we would borrow it from. So it would be worth your while to develop it. Now, as far as entrepreneurs using equipment from a national, you know, NSF facility, I really don't know what, what NSF's, you know, philosophy would be on something like that. There are these, you know, SBIR programs for small business to get funding to advance technology. So that might be a route for something like that. Yeah, I mean, a colleague of mine did have one of those SBIR, not an SBIR, but they had an entrepreneurship program. NSF sponsored that. Um, I don't recall the name of it. It was the previous director of NSF who was big on that. 
So maybe All right, I'm going to ask uh, two last questions here that I hope will be relatively short. So one is from Miguel Valencia, and it's a question of how do you track groundwater plumes using ERT or SP? Can you use any of these methods to monitor deep injection wells at 2,000 feet? Um, at 2,000 feet, you'd be want you'd want to be using uh, magnetotelluric methods, and the answer is that yes. Uh, people do this. That it's a big industry in, in geothermal exploration. They do a lot of uh, monitoring um, with electromagnetic methods. Yes. Great. All right. Next question from Stephen Hernandez. This is for Christine. I was wondering if Dr. Larson has observed any co-seismic changes in snowpack or soil moisture with her GPS technique. I'm thinking something akin to a low-grade liquefaction avalanche triggered by the strong shaking. That's an easy one. No. I haven't. I Great. Haven't. All right. That, um, so I see there's one question, a comment here from Ross Henderson. And I'm just going to, we're going to go a little bit over here just to answer this is a good one. NSF currently has a decadal call for proposals called signals in the soil. NSF has a grand challenge using distributed acoustic sensing, DASs. What are the prospects for increasing the sensitivity of soil signals to nanoscales for functional genomics of the soil microbiome using a helically wound dark? Dark fiber. Paul Seva at the University of Colorado has done seminal work on these sort of DASs. Any comments on, on DASs or these other questions? I don't know enough about DAS to answer that question. Great. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We are over time. We are now in a break time period. Um, we will reconvene in 12 minutes at 1.30 Eastern time. So uh, enjoy your break. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to panel two of this afternoon's meeting. Uh, my name is Jessica Warren. I'm an associate professor at the University of Delaware and also a member of the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics. And I will be moderating today's session. This session is going to focus on the latest developments in environmental geophysics with five exciting short talks from Danica Roth, Claire Mastella, Maureen Denol, Zongwen Dan, and Wenyuan Fan. Each speaker will present an eight minute talk with another two minutes for question and answer before group discussion at the end. Um, in addition to the talks, Danica has agreed to give a brief introduction on environmental seismology at the start of this session. And when you're in, who will give the final talk is gonna take a few minutes at the end to synthesize all of the talks before the group discussion. So to begin with, we will have Danica Roth speaking. Danica is an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Mines. Her primary research interests center on understanding the coupling of surface processes with regional variables such as climate, biology, and anthropogenic influences in order to better relate process mechanics to landscape evolution, to landscape form and evolution across scales. And with that, I will ask Danica to take it away. You, you're still muted. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, and hear you, great. All right, great. Um, okay, so, uh, so I wanted to start this talk with reading part of the John Muir quote that inspired its title, because I think it does a really great job of describing why seismology is such an intuitive tool for studying rivers and other surface processes. So he describes the, uh, the sounds of a river over various topographies and says that anyone who has learned the language of running water will see its character in the dark. And if you've ever stood by a waterfall, you probably know what he means here. We can feel and hear the elastic waves that are generated by rivers um, and by many other processes that act over a wide range of spatial and temporal scales on the Earth's surface. Um, a lot of these are challenging to study with traditional monitoring techniques because they're either happening in places that are hard to observe or because they're stochastic and can occur very suddenly in regions uh, that just aren't instrumented. So as we learn to understand this language of seismic waves, we're finding that environmental seismology offers us some unique advantages and opportunities. Uh, it gives us continuous and high resolution records for process monitoring and event detection. It's useful for characterizing the properties of materials that the waves travel through. Um, and seismic signals are also a direct link to energy transfer to the ground, which means they offer potential insights into fundamental energy budgets, 
as well as coupling and cascades among processes. So here are just three examples from rivers. In one recent study, seismic data was used to identify a glacial lake outburst flood and infer that by mobilizing uh, channel stabilizing boulders, these floods may actually be the, the primary driver of long-term fluvial erosion in the Himalaya rather than uh, precipitation. Seismic records have also identified seasonal transitions in sediment supply regimes driven by typhoon-induced landsliding in Taiwan. And a couple studies have pointed to low frequency ground tilts as measuring precipitation loading or possibly fluctuating pressure on stream banks caused by turbulent eddies. So these studies highlight, they highlight kind of some of the big picture insights uh, that we're gaining from fluvial seismology. But for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on a more complex and challenging question uh, of measuring and predicting sediment transport rates. This is basically one of the holy grails of fluvial geomorphology. Sediment transport underpins all questions of erosion, deposition, landscape evolution. Um, it has direct impacts on ecology, hazards, water quality, range of other fields. And our models are pretty bad at predicting it because sediment transport is really nonlinear and stochastic. So our models are calibrated with empirical data from laboratory flumes or real rivers. But because of the nonlinearity, we really can't just extrapolate that to predict what's happening at high flows. Um, like this when, when the majority of sediment transport actually happens and when physical sampling is really dangerous and logistically challenging. So seismology gives us an alternative approach to capturing continuous high time resolution data using instrumentation that's relatively cheap, easy to install and external to the channel. So uh, I wanna start with exploring kind of a best case scenario at one of the most extensively instrumented streams in the world where we actually have independent measurements of discharge precipitation rates and sediment transport, which is measured by this line of impact sensing geophones installed under steel plates in the stream bed just out of sight in this photo. So we wanted to use this data to identify the signatures of these three distinct processes in the seismic spectra that were recorded outside the channel on seismometers. And what we learned from the study was that if we have enough independent constraints as we did here, Process rates are actually recoverable from the spectral data. We used a least squares regression of the power spectral density at each frequency to identify the spectral contributions from each process. So the power per unit, uh, precipitation, discharge, or sediment transport. And then we can invert that regression with measured discharge and precipitation uh, and seismic power to actually estimate the transport reasonably well. In cases where we don't have independent measurements of sediment transport to calibrate the seismic data, which is most cases, um, we can still glean qualitative insights. These are photos and hydrographs from a study where we looked at the impacts of two floods following a dam removal in Taiwan, where a large amount of material trapped behind the dam was transported in the first flood. Essentially, nothing was left to move in a later very similar flood. And when we plot the seismic amplitude against the water depth, we find that the flood with high transport rates shows a large amount of hysteresis, uh, clockwise in this case, in the relationship between seismic amplitude and flow depth. So this is actually a really common observation in sediment transport studies, where we often see higher transport on the rising limb of a flood than at equivalent flow strength on the falling limb. Um, and a number of studies like ours have interpreted similar hysteresis in the seismic data as a result of sediment transport adding to the signal on the rising limb of the flood. So in this study, we defined a hysteresis metric for the normalized area in this curve at each of seven stations along the river. And we found that it actually tracked the downstream advection and dispersion of that pulse of sediment that was released from the dam. So you can see the pulse moving downstream here and spreading out between the first and second flood. So this looks like hysteresis scales with sediment transport rates, which is a conclusion that several studies, including ours, have drawn or assumed. We were wrong though. Um, Going back to our very well instrumented site in Switzerland, this is the hysteresis in seismic data compared to hysteresis in actual sediment transport data for each of these five flood events. And they don't match. These little loops here uh, are showing either clockwise or counterclockwise hysteresis. And the gray regions are showing hysteresis going in opposite directions in four out of five events, meaning the seismic signal is higher when sediment transport is lower and vice versa. So what's causing that hysteresis? It's water turbulence. 
Seismic power is very sensitive to both bed roughness and flow velocity, which means it's fundamentally influenced by the movement or just rearrangement of sediment on the bed, which can happen without producing a net flux. So without additional data, we can't distinguish changes in seismic power due to changes in sediment flux versus rearrangement of the turbulent boundary layer, which poses a major challenge for trying to interpret this kind of hysteresis quantitatively. Um, but it could also be an opportunity to gain new information about turbulent flow and bed dynamics during floods, which is also really challenging to study. So work on this front is being advanced by theoretical models that are closing the gap between our seismic observations, flow characteristics, and sediment transport theory. But uh, inversion of observed spectra to recover sediment transport rates requires a lot of site-specific parameters and mo model validation. So these models still remain largely unvalidated in real settings because independent data is just really hard to obtain. So we really need more controlled studies with well-constrained parameters and variables before these approaches will become broadly applicable to real rivers. Um, so on that note, I wanted to end on some very new work that my colleagues and I have just started using a distributed acoustic sensing or DAS system, which I know someone was just asking about. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with DAS, it's essentially measuring strain at discrete points or channels along a fiber optic cable, which you can just see uh, going into the water here. So we zigzagged it up the creek and then back down the bank here. Uh, we sampled at 20 kilohertz for 15 minutes. The channels are set to two meter increments. So you go around tugging the cable to identify the channels associated with key physical locations, which lets us align the spatial spectrogram with the landscape um, and pinpoint hydraulic features like these rapids, which you can see in the spectrogram here. So we're seeing some interesting spectral evolution or gliding as the channel geometry changes along stream here, which is really similar to what a few previous studies have observed in river spectra that are evolving in time. For example, this spectrogram from our dam removal study. But this DAS data is just the isolated signal of water turbulence. Uh, there's no sediment transport happening in the channel. So since the channel geometry and bed surface here are really well known, we hope that this kind of short time high spatial resolution data can help us examine the connections between the spectrum uh, and fluid ground coupling to explain some of the spectral shifts that are observed in more dynamically evolving rivers with fewer independent constraints. Um, and I guess I will just leave my last slide up here to leave time for questions, but to, to quickly summarize, uh, there are a lot of opportunities we're advancing on, but there are also a lot of uh, important challenges and needs that um, future studies can help us address. So I'll leave the rest of my time for questions. Great, thank you, Danica. Um, do I have any questions from the panel? Um, and uh, uh, participants should also um, add questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna lead, off with a question to um, ask you to talk a little bit more about the challenges of you know whether you are always going to have to do some ground truthing or you think it, that this will get to a point where you don't have to instrument every river to be able to make a prediction. I'm very hopeful that that will be the case. I think right now we just don't have enough data to to kind of explore the whole parameter space. Rivers are really heterogeneous. There's I mean, just among different kinds of rivers, there are some that are on bedrock and there are some that are, the ground is made out of boulders. Um, so the attenuation uh, is a huge, a huge issue. Um, and there's also different kinds of transport that happen in rivers, there's different stream geometries. So I think as we get more data that's paired with well-constrained environmental variables, then, you know, maybe the hope is eventually we can go out it's really easy to measure something like stream discharge. Um, so hopefully once we can constrain that and uh, kind of site geometry, things like that, then it'll give us a better tool to use these theoretical models maybe to actually invert measured seismic data to estimate sediment transport rates. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have one question from Rosemary Knight in the um, questions list. Um, and her question is, as you look at the link between your seismic data and sediment load, is there an observable change as you transition from a dilute concentration of particles to a slurry? 
as that changes the moduli? That's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have data on, on when and where the actual sediment concentration is changing. Um, so that would be a great subject for a controlled seismic study. I believe that the one of the papers that I cited in my example with uh, Chow et al. 2015, I think, they were looking at changes in suspended load versus bed load seasonally. I don't think they looked at slurries, but similar. <laughs> Great. Um, and then uh, we have one last uh, question, which is going to come from Mark Vane on the panel. Hey, Danica, great talk. Um, so not knowing anything about how hard it is to measure sediment transport, I'm just curious in terms of practicality, like if you have to go out and put out seismometers, what's the benefit relative to measuring sediment transport? And can you, how close do you need to put a station to a river system? Or can we use existing stations to make a lot of these measurements um, already without having to um, add additional ones? Yeah, so I can share my screen because I actually have a supplementary slide. Whoops. Are you seeing my? It's just white, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry. Just top two. OK, are you seeing that now? Yeah. OK, so these are some of the ways that we um, that we can calibrate our, our data and measure stuff. So uh, a lot of our sediment transport data that goes into theory comes from the lab flume. If you're trying to measure it in channel, there's, I mean, there's basically like you go out with waders and a basket on a stick. Um, so in stream sampler, there's sediment traps. There's like uh, basket samplers uh, attached to larger instrumentation. This stuff is like, you cannot do this in a flooding river or you very much might drown. A lot of in-stream instrumentation gets washed down rivers or gets damaged in large floods, uh, especially if there's bed load moving. So it's it's a pretty major challenge. This place where we measured it um, is, is in Switzerland, so it's backed by Swiss funding. Uh, and this is like automated basket samplers that move into the flow. It's got plate geophones, it's a whole thing. Um, and there are a few places uh, where people are installing these in the US, but there it's a major undertaking. So with a seismometer, I mean, we rented instruments from Pascal and ours were installed very close to the channel. People have also uh, done studies where they're hundreds of meters away from the channel. Um, and I think it depends on what you're trying to get at. The attenuation question is still an open one. So distance from channel is, I, I don't have a clear answer on that. Mm -hmm. But the ease of use and convenience uh, is, like orders of magnitude, I would say. Great, thanks. Great, thank you, Danica, for a great talk. Um, so we uh, are now a little bit over time, so we are going to move on to our next speaker, which is Claire Mistella. Claire is an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research focuses on the role of sediment transport and erosion mechanics in driving landscape evolution across a range of spatial and temporal scales. Um, and so Claire, you can take it away, please. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, to both. Okay, excellent. Hi, everyone. And thanks so much for the invite to present in this session. And so I'm going to talk about some of the recent progress that's been made in using environmental seismology on rocky coastlines. And so about half of the world's coastlines are rocky. And given this, the geomorphology community is really interested in understanding the conditions under which these coastlines form and erode. And we're particularly interested in assessing how sensitive these coasts might be to a changing wave climate, because we know that wave height and variability have both increased over the last 50 years and will continue to do so in the future. And so we really want to understand how this will impact coastal erosion hazards and landscape evolution. And so to get at this, we first need to figure out when cliffs erode. And, rocky, and erosion on rocky coasts isn't steady. Instead, it's dominated by these infrequent large collapse events. And a spoiler here is that we still don't really know when and why cliffs collapse. So this question presents a very clear outstanding challenge for prediction of future coastal change. 
So why haven't we cracked this code? First, our observations are really varied, which is to say that bigger storms do not always guarantee a bigger cliff collapse. In addition, the tensile strength of cliff rocks far exceeds the stresses applied by winds, waves, and tides. So any individual weather event is going to have a really hard time breaking cliff rock. Then, because cliff erosion is so episodic, we really don't have great constraints on modern rocky coast erosion rates. And then finally, these new nearshore environments can be incredibly challenging to instrument, which really limits our ability to constrain energy flux at the cliff face. So enter environmental seismology. So there's an exceptional opportunity here to use seismic methods to work towards establishing links between environmental forcing, sea cliff strength, and cliff erosion. And because we can capture cliff response to environmental forces at a very high resolution, and also resolve the timing and size of individual erosion events, we can start to discern the causes of these collapses. And so we need to start by disentangling different aspects of our seismic signals to better isolate those potential drivers. And so we typically do this through the comparison of our seismic data sets to other environmental data sets. And so in this example, you can see that we have tides and waves and wind all being integrated into this power spectra. And so let's start to break it apart. And we'll start with wind. And so wind energy is persistent on rocky coasts, but it's also very weak. So energy fluxes from wind are about two orders of magnitude less than those of waves or tides. And so there is some correlation between wind intensity and the number of small failure events but that correlation remains pretty weak. We can also look at the influence of tides. And in general, tides act to amplify wave signals. That's because as our tide rises, the wave breaking is going to shift closer to the cliff face. That's in turn going to increase cliff shaking and then potentially enhance cliff erosion. We can of course then look at the waves themselves. And so ocean swell can load and unload the nearshore at a frequency consistent with the wave period. But the influence of that nearshore deflection on cliff erosion rates remains completely unexplored. So most of the work thus far has really focused on the influence of wave impacts, which are these high frequency events that result as a direct contact between wave meeting rock. And in general, average ground motion increases with increasing significant wave height. But for individual waves, the type of wave influences the intensity of that ground motion quite a bit, with breaking waves tending to do the most work. So in addition to looking at the integration of all of those environmental forces, we can also capture cliff failure events. And so it is possible to detect, locate, and estimate cliff failure volumes from seismic data. However, it's really worth stressing here that depending on your environment, these can be exceedingly rare. And in particular, in very high energy environments or in areas with very hard or massive rocks, these can become really tough to identify or rare to observe. But it is possible to see them and people are working on it. So, but one thing that all of these studies have in common is that we're measuring how much the cliff shakes. And so what we're interested in is what is the role of that shaking in and of itself in driving rock erosion. And so in one of the seminal um, applications of environmental seismology to rocky coasts, Pete Adams noticed that ground motion decays with distance from the cliff face as seismic waves attenuate. So based on that observation, Pete hypothesized that this repeated flexure, repeated shaking of the cliff allows for the development of rock damage near the cliff face, which preconditions the rock to erode under more moderate environmental forcing. One caveat of this hypothesis is that it has yet to be tied explicitly to cliff rock, ah, to cliff rock properties or to cliff retreat. And we also haven't been able to observe a damage zone present at the cliff face. So some of my recent work has tried to start nibbling further on this question. And I'm going to show you some very preliminary, preliminary results of that. So we got our hands on four different Rocky Coast seismic data sets. Orkney in the UK being one that I interest, instrumented myself as part of my postdoc. And we compared them to assess the potential signature of damage via that repetitive shaking across all of our sites. 
And so it's worth pointing out here as well that while there are a number of these types of data sets floating around, they're hard to find and they've never been directly compared before. And so first things first, we wanted to see how Clifta's placement scaled with wave height across our sites. And we found in general that hourly displacement increases with hourly significant wave height, but with varying degrees of sensitivity. And so Orkney is far and away our most sensitive site in terms of differences in ground motion relating to variable wave height. And so what we found is that sensitivity um, is nicely explained by the average position of wave breaking across our sites with wave breaking on Orkney happening very, very close to the coast, which leads to this much more faithful translation of differences in wave height into differences in ground motion. Um, we also wanted to take a closer look at ground motion attenuation following the work of Adams to see if we could see similar patterns across our sites. What we found for three of our sites is that once we correct for wave breaking distance, our ground displacement at each site follows a one over the square root of distance attenuation pattern consistent with surface waves. However, attenuation at our Orkney site is enhanced compared to all of our other sites. So this implies potentially maybe an increase in the role of body waves at this site or potentially an additional signature of rock damage, which leads to this additional loss of energy as the seismic waves move landward. So if we want to break this apart to look at attenuation as a function of wave height. We see that we get increased attenuation with increasing wave height, which is a pattern that we don't observe at any of our other sites. So taken together, we suggest that the potential for rock damage processes may be higher at our Orkney site due to this increased sensitivity to coast um, of the coastline to variable wave conditions and this enhanced attenuation. However, we like those before us have yet to connect these observations explicitly to cliff material properties or cliff erosion, but we are working on it. So we plan to do further analysis of these attenuation patterns. We've also collected two active seismic surveys to look for evidence of this damage layer. And we're also thinking about how we might apply ambient noise techniques to explore temporal changes in cliff properties. So this is all very much still a work in progress. These observations though have informed a broader landscape evolution story, but unfortunately I don't have time to talk about that today. But what I can tell you is that the sensitivity of these coastlines is largely controlled by local uplift rates and nearshore morphology. And so Orkney is, our poten is potentially our most sensitive site to these future changes in wave climate. What that ultimately means for erosion, we still can't say. And so just to wrap up here, um, we've made a lot of progress towards separating signals related to distinct environmental forces on rocky coasts and monitoring failures, as well as starting to assess the potential of different failure mechanisms across sites. Um, there are still a lot of challenges, including really linking those environmental forces to erosion. We've also only done a limited interrogation of the influence and evolution of cliff material properties, as well as we haven't really looked at precursors to failure at all, but there's a lot of opportunity here to develop early warning systems. In addition, we have a small number of data sets. These environments are really noisy. We're dealing with directional sources and failure is rare, so erosion is hard to measure. So I will leave you with a video from Orkney to show you the sort of dry, this drivers of the signals that we're dealing with. And yes, this is a waterfall that is blowing back uphill. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you for a wonderful talk, Claire. Um, so do we have any questions from the panel or in the Q&A? There is, I'm gonna say now, there is a great question from Emily Brodsky in the Q&A. But I'm going to save that for the general discussion question because it's directed at um, both of our first two speakers and I think it can easily um, seed along the discussion. So I'm going to hold on to that. Um, and there was also a, a previous question for Danica that we will um, come back around to in the discussion session. Um, so I, I'm actually going to lead with a question for Claire and then somebody else should jump in. Um, and my question is, um, you mentioned that um, it's been hard with the seismometers to capture failure during deployment. And I'm wondering whether there's been any kind of probabilistic modeling based on the past frequency of occurrence to try to um, focus in on the, the, um, the deployment window that would have a higher probability of having an event. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. So a lot of this also ends up being really site specific. So the failure size distribution does follow a pretty, the like magnitude frequency distribution is fairly well behaved for individual sites. But unfortunately, still, we have such sparse monitoring efforts that we haven't really explored how portable those distributions are between sites. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, and if I have um, no, I see no more questions coming up and to keep us on track in that case, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Um, so we will now hear from Maureen Denal. Maureen is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on predicting the dynamics of earthquakes and their ground motions in a changing earth. In particular, she uses, the, she uses seismic signals to characterize the physical processes that control them. Um, so you are now good to go, Maureen. As, as soon as you unmute. All right, thank you. Can you see everything? I can see and hear you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me to this session. I'm actually still learning a ton about potential for seismology and environmental studies. Today, I'm going to uh, show you preliminary work we're doing um, with graduate students and postdoc and undergraduate, Julian, Laura, and Tim. I'm showing you in the background the photo of the Folsom Lake Dam um, before and during the droughts in California which really motivated a uh, part of my research program. Uh, and these changes that are quite drastic are something that we're trying to track with seismic waves. So um, to tell you a little bit about how we do this, um, I basically, we record ambient vibrations, uh, technique that was briefly introduced in Claire's talk uh, just recently. And by recording these ambient seismic vibrations at these two stations, uh, we're trying to understand and image the Earth structure as a function of time. We do this by cross-correlating these two time series um, shown here in this, uh, this function G. Now, if the Earth change in between these two measurements, we can make another measurement of this function and we can extract Earth properties by making the difference between these two waveforms. So if I take a measurement at time, you know, the black time series or the red time series, what we notice in these waveforms really late in the coda so we are, are able to measure phase shifts um, actually in a better way than we would do in the early arrivals. And these phase shifts are actually proportional to the change in velocity. It's a very average measurement between the two stations. So using this uh, type of measurement to monitor groundwater levels is not new. Um, a great uh, team from Germany has done that in 2006 to look at volcanic response in Indonesia. And what they found with this uh, time series shown in uh, blue and red, this dv over v measurement, is the change, relative change in, in seismic velocities. These changes seems to be anti-correlated with the groundwater level shown here in black. And so we took this into a different system and we started looking at California. Uh, this time series here shown in, in black, this change in velocity, flipped, um, flipped uh, axis here, are shown against the groundwater level that was uh, measured uh, during uh, this 18 year survey in San Gabriel. So San Gabriel is one of these uh, urban managed aquifer and confined aquifer in Southern California. Um, it's also where Caltech is. And so there's great long record of seismic data and digital seismometers. And so we use um, this place of study, this natural laboratory to basically look at these, these variations. And you can see that the change in velocities that we measure um, seems to match quite well the changes of the groundwater that was measured at that, uh, the well that was in center of that aquifer um, then. And there's no phase lag or anything, given this 30-day um, average. So what we found is um, over successive droughts in California, we have the regular pattern of dry multiple years, wet events, dry years, wet few years. We can see that um, the, the groundwater levels are going down and down and down. So this was the kind of a first, uh, first year project for my amazing grad students and we're, we're scaling this up. Um, to go back on this time series, we also looked at how the specially we could map this change in velocities. And to do so, we just did a crude averaging in between these, um, the stations shown in, in, the, um, in the blue triangles here. 
also showing the GPA STEM series. This was our first attempt to do a geodesy and seismology together. This map here is showing you a direct comparisons between the change in velocity and the groundwater level and an estimated volume loss uh, during the 2012-2016 drought. We were fortunate enough to um, collect the free data on these um, actual managed um, uh, water levels for this aquifer, and we were able to calculate about the same amount of volume that was pumped during that time. Um, we also found this large wet events in 2005, the winter of 2005, where the, the aquifer actually inflated, that was seen by inserted ashing here on the top right. Um, this is our interpolated map that we uh, produced on the, for that blue area where the, ve the velocity decreases, the water level went up, and the vertical um, vector here is showing the GPS uplift that occurred during that time. And so this, this slide is basically showing you where, where I want to go in my research program is how can we measure seismic waves with GNSS data, with INSTAR data, with groundwater, how can we combine these all to create data products that could be useful for groundwater management. Um, we're also trying to do this in Mexico City and it's work done uh, by Laura and Estelle. Estelle has been doing really fantastic work on combining different type of geodetic measurements to look at long-term 100 year scale um, analysis of the Mexico City. Mexico City is, is in big trouble. Um, they empty their lake, they're still um, pumping groundwater for urban use. As you can see in this photo, this nice uh, non-uniform basin subsidence that occurs in the lake. Uh, Estelle has been working and has this paper in review on uh, subsidence in the, um, in the uh, Mexico City area from 96 to 2020. Um, and so when we're reaching out to her and ask if she could help us understand our data, uh, the top uh, left plot here is showing her, her time series, 100 year time series of relative um, elevation in, in Mexico City. And you can see this very nice puzzling and troubling uh, linear trend as things go down. And she's really um, helped uh, fill the gap for this 1995 until 2D data. The bottom left plot is showing what Laura was showing is uh, the change in velocities. And just to give you a, a bulk sense is as the land uh, subsides, the velocities go up. And we're doing this study over a 30 year time scale. So this is, you know, moderates velocity change, but very sustained um, uh, after uh, changing of the properties. Um, to achieve a large scale work, we uh, turn to cloud computing. We've been uh, using AWS because some of these data archives are already on, on the cloud. Um, we found that Ambionox seismology is very uh, well suited for embarrassing parallelization. And so the cloud is perfectly suited for this type of work. We've, we've gone into um, very nice throughput speeds of about two gigs per second for these archives. Um, it also allows us to produce data and make it available. Um, so we developed these tools for this. And now we're back to California and trying to analyze this large scale data set. Um, the Southern California Earthquake Center is all online there. It's about a hundred terabytes of data, which is pretty nice. We are combining this with a 30, about 30 terabytes of Northern California and some of the temporary array. Um, and Tim has been deploying these tools and Julian has been also helping on the data workflow part of it. So this is our system, which will combine with Northern California in a little bit. I'm just going to show you a brief overview of yesterday's plots of how the velocity changes as a function of different environmental factors. The foremost important is that temperature affects velocity drastically. This is a two to four hertz um, type of wave. So we are in the upper 500 meters annually, as you can see with this um, time scale from 2000 until today, um, there's a strong effect, um, maybe a percent of changes in velocities due to the, the temperature. So we have to deal with this. Um, the water level seems to be the number two if not sometimes number one effect on this time series. It really depends where. Uh, so this is um, a time series from the station NGQ since 2003 and the Alisal uh, Reservoir surface elevation that you see in blue. Um, the, the velocity that you see here in, in red are showing this quite strange um, drop recovery and drop and then slow recovery that I was actually not familiar with because we didn't have that in the earthquakes in California then. Um, but when Tim plotted that against the reservoir level, we could see that there's a somewhat direct correspondence between the, the, the reservoir levels 
and uh, the velocity. So note this is not loading that we're seeing uh, because the velocities go down with uh, water level going up. So we think this is just a saturation uh, problem, but we're not hydrologists. So here we are giving this presentations to a more expert audience. Um, water level again seems to affect these time series. This is the Southern Sea level. Um, so we're looking again at 15 years um, worth of data. You can see the annual um, signals there um, and then the velocity that constantly uh, seems to be going up. Again, uh, Mo sorry, Marie, you have about 30 seconds. Thanks. I'll go fast. This is a very rich data set. Um, earthquakes also affect this time series. And so what I wanted to uh, conclude is that I, I'm trying to put this together as a community that we want to have a virtual observatory of all these data sets together with this team of awesome colleagues where we want to combine all these uh, data. Voila. Thank you. Great. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm going to uh, lead off with a question that is in the Q&A right now. Um, this is from Dean Whitman. Um, and the question is, beyond detecting changes in groundwater stage, can these passive seismic methods be used to map spatial variations in aquifer properties such as porosity? I'm not sure about the porosity aspect because we do see a um, spatial pattern, but it, it could also, there's, there must be some other hydrological parameters that control fluid flow that um, we're not, you know, we're not sensitive to. But maybe by doing a refined temporal evolution of the functional forms for the recovery, you know, if we have a steep recovery or a lock function, there's, there may be some um, models that could help us um, discriminate between uh, this type of, I mean, if porosity is one of this. The idea of also thinking about changing porosity as a function of time is to see how, um, how these DV uh, measurements respond through time, whether with the groundwater. So seeing if we're not recovering as much where the velocities do not match the groundwater level anymore, it could be that we cannot, um, uh, that the, the aquifer is no longer responding elastically. So I think these are the analysis we'd like to get into eventually. Great. Okay, there is a question from Rosemary Knight in the Q&A, but we are gonna hold that um, until the end so that we stay on track. Thank you for a great talk, Maureen. We are now um, going to move on to Zhongwen Zhang. Um, Zhongwen is an assistant professor at the California Institute of Technology. His research focuses on seismic imaging of Earth structure, earthquake rupture processes, and the intersection of seismology and environmental science. Um, and so you are good to go. Great. <clears throat> Thank I can you. see your slide and hear you. Okay, great. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. So today I'm going to talk about submarine environment sensing or telecommunication fiber optical cables. So I hope that by the end of this talk, I can convince you that there's a new field that's emerging by using pre-existing cables, like the one shown in the left, either on a cable observatory or on long haul cables, transatlantic ones to monitor submarine environment. This field is very much in the infancy, so a lot of challenges still need to be overcome. So as a seismologist, you know, I, it's not hard for me to see why we need summary instrumentation. We always want to have global uniform coverage, but it's not surprising that oceanographers also cares about the ocean uh, just as much. Uh, and they study ocean waves, internal wave, tidal, currents, and so on. Many of these can also be observed on summary seismometers, but for most of us, it's a noise. Uh, but they also actually care a lot about seismoacoustic waves. Uh, for example, we know that the ocean temperature is really important in understanding glo uh, global warming. The chart to the right shows the excessive energy uh, trapped on Earth, and more than 90% of that is in the ocean. So they have spent a lot of effort in trying to constrain, measure ocean's temperature, especially in a deep ocean. And the one of the great idea was using acoustic waves to do thermometry. Uh, the idea is that ocean acoustic waves trapped in the sofa channel can propagate a very large distance. 
If you can set up acoustic, repeating acoustic sources, then you can measure the speed very accurately, and that turns out to be mostly controlled uh, by temperature. This was an idea proposed by uh, Walter Monk in the 1970s. Unfortunately, this idea was halted due to environmental concerns, ironically, and now the most important way to measure ocean temperature is using flows like Argo. Just last year, uh, when Bo Wu, a postal in my group, proposed to revive this idea, instead of using man-made repeating sources, we can actually use repeating earthquakes to do it. Uh, so for example, to the top left, you can see two earthquakes T wave, the acoustic wave from the earthquake detected by an island station we call a T phase. And you can see they're very similar to each other, the red and the blue, but they have a time shift. It turns out this time shift is due to ocean temperature. We can measure Indian Ocean's warming over more than 10 years uh, and compare it with very nicely with ARCO data. So we're sort of in a situation where you know, we have a new way of measuring ocean temperature, but the data we are using here and the station we're using here are very similar to the seismology ones. So the future success of this kind of effort will rely on a better sensor uh, coverage around the globe. So I'm going to talk about DAS a little bit first. Uh, a few people mentioned DAS already. DAS is disputed acoustic sensing. It's capable of converting a long cable into many, many sensors. For the application of submarine cases, their most important feature is that equipment is only required at one end on the land end of the cable. You don't actually need to do anything uh, along the cable. Because of this very nice property of deploying dense array in summary environment, this field really expanded very fast. These are just uh, some papers that's already published uh, in many different scenarios, but mostly on what I call the research type uh, cables. For example, the one to the right is a recent paper in Japan where they use a cable observatories, uh, telecom fiber, uh, turn that into a 50 kilometer long cable. Of course, this is a detection of a small earthquake on that cable. You can see nicely P and S waves. Uh, this is what seismologists were studying the solid earth were very excited about. But at the same time, very interestingly, on the same cable, they also observed hydroacoustic waves on that. In this particular case, it was caused, it was uh, uh, sent out from uh, uh, man-made air gun shots. Uh, but this gave me some confidence that maybe we will be able to see earthquake T waves on that very soon. And this would come back to this uh, ocean uh, seismic thermometry idea uh, so that we can probably wind it using fibers to measure uh, ocean temperature uh, as well. Not only uh, does uh, in summer environment can measure seismic waves and acoustic waves, it actually can also detect the ocean waves. This experiment we did a few years ago offshore barging is a 40 kilometer long cable connecting a wind farm. We turned that into a couple of thousand sensors. This was a, just a snapshot, a short section of uh, data on that cable, uh, five kilometer section here. You can see there are actually a lot of different patterns here. Some are more horizontal, some are more tiered. It's hard to see what they are, but because we have a very dense array here, we can do like this FK transform to look at what's their speed of propagation. It turns out you can see the blue part are showing where you have the biggest energy. The dash line are showing you the speed. You can see there's one package of energy that's a seismic wave. This is actually ambient seismic noise propagating on the ocean floor. And the other one is around kind of 10 meter per second. This is actually ocean surface uh, gravity waves. Um, uh, what can we do when we observe ocean surface gravity waves? Well, Marin Denault earlier showed uh, us how, how to do ocean, uh, seismic wave interferometry by looking at NB nodes. You can get the Green's function between two sides. It turns out this theory can also apply to ocean waves. The left figure is showing their Green's function, the ocean wave extracted along the cable. So you, you turn one of the sensor as a source and see how the ocean waves propagating along the cable. Also similar to what Marin did, uh, detecting subsurface change. Now we can detect how ocean acoustic wave speed change, uh, ocean water wave speed change in the ocean. Well, they doesn't really change except if there is a current 
then it have a Doppler effect or show slow down or speed up the uh, ocean surface waves. The figure to the top left is showing you over about 100 hours how the ocean wave travel time is changing. And we can convert that to the bottom figure, the ocean current speed. Uh, along the cable. So you can very clearly see this ocean current uh, in this particular region is a strongly tidally uh, modulated. So this is start to, we can detect you know, ocean current and some ocean wave, some of this oceanographer's interest at a very fine uh, temporal and spatial scales that cannot do uh, in conventional method. So, but that also have its uh, limitation. It requires dark fiber. And because it's using back scattered away, you can really only use very short sections uh, of fiber near both ends. If you have, you know, that's very useful for cable observatories if you don't have a long cable. But if you're talking about transoceanic cables, you know, talking about very tiny portions on both ends of the fiber. Can we also use the long haul cables to do better uh, monitoring of summer environment? Well, recently we proposed a new idea is instead of using back scatter light, we use the polarization of the forward propagating light, the direct way, and use it to monitor summer environment. Uh, the reason is that if you bend or you know, apply stress uh, to your fiber in, in the summer environment, it will actually cause change in light polarization. It, it turns out telecom operators, they also care about the polarization for their own telecommunication purpose. So they are actually already measuring polarizations in real time. Uh, so we apply this new technology to a long cable, a 10,000 kilometer one cable connecting Los Angeles to Chile. This is a cable curio owned by Google. And we were able to detect uh, dozens of earthquakes showing at the yellow uh, stars along the uh, cable in about 10 months. But interested to this topic, to the topic today, we were also able to detect the ocean swell event. Um, so in the top figure here, I'm showing you one and a half months of data of spectrogram uh, in the frequency band of so-called primary macro seismic. What you can see is this red blob of the energy dispersive ones lasting a few days and they come back every few days. It turns out that you can also observe the same patterns on coastal stations. Uh, you see both the primary and secondary macro seism. It, it turns out that all these packages of energy are due to an ocean swell event applying pressure uh, on their cable. So the fact that we only observe the primary macro seism around 0.06 Hertz instead of 0.12 uh, Hertz on the SOP polarization measurement is telling us that we are actually measuring their ocean pre bottom pressure perturbation instead of the seismic wave generated by their uh, ocean waves. So sort of this is my uh, uh, summary here. I think there is a very promising future of submarine fiber sensing. Of course, I'm motivated to do all of this because of the interest in solid Earth geophysics. It turns out the method can also observe many, many ocean uh, processes. So it applies very well to submarine environmental sensing. It measures hydroacoustic waves, ocean waves, ocean current. I'm sure there will be more interesting observations uh, coming up. Uh, there are actually multiple emerging technologies. I focus on DAS and the polarization today, but there is also phase approach. There are also smart cable approach. Maybe there are even uh, new technologies coming up. And, and finally, I want to say that to make this field, new field uh, successful, we need collaborations among seismology, oceanography, but also fiber optics, uh, physics, and telecom industry. And the potentially with help from government regula regulatory agencies to help us access uh, the, the fiber cables and uh, assemble their uh, resources uh, together. So with that, I uh, thank you for their interest and love to take any questions. Great, thank you. That was, um, those are really cool applications. Um, so we have a question from Rangan, and then um, I think we will move on after that, but uh, continue putting questions in the Q&A and we will come back around to those. Thanks, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, my question goes to um, actually handling the data because uh, this is all very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about uh, very long fiber optic cables. I know it's very data intensive. How are you handling all this data and what's the future 
um, approach to doing this work with uh, uh, dealing with the massive um, sampling rate and <laughs> long cable. Thanks. Right, that's a great question, and it's a very active discussion going on in the DAS community. Uh, just to mention that the polarization approach, because it's an integrated measurement along a cable, it actually doesn't produce as much data. But for DAS, you, really, you indeed produce uh, terabytes of data every day. Uh, and uh, frankly, right now, every group is handling it differently. Uh, one of the potential solutions is, uh, like what Marine said, go to the cloud. But I think if we want this to be an effort of a bigger community, then we need facility support uh, to handle the data challenge. Uh, remember that is both a storage challenge and a data processing challenge at the same time. Thank you. Great, thank you for an excellent talk. We are going to move on to our final speaker of the session. So Wen Yuan Fan is going to round up our talks for today. Um, and he will give a couple extra slides at the end of his own talk to give us a summary. Wen Yuan is an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, as well as the University of California, San Diego. His research focuses on using seismic, seismic observations collected both onshore and offshore to study the earth, earthquakes and environmental processes, including hurricanes, landslides, and turbulent subglacial rivers. Um, and so when you're in, you can go ahead now. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for the committee for the opportunity and thank you for the audience. This is excellent. Um, today we will talk about geohazards, in particular some marine landslides. But before I start the talk, I would first like to acknowledge all my co-authors and collaborators Research is collaborative efforts in nature, and I'm grateful for all the opportunities. So there are a lot of submarine landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see from the bathymetry map, various of the sizes of slides have occurred here. As a matter of fact, the largest submarine landslide around the US margin occurred on the Texas slope. And submarine landslides can damage offshore infrastructures, for example, cables. Uh, and also other things. Here is an example that some marine landslide in the Gulf of Mexico damaged a oil platform. And because of the difficulties to um, uh, stop it, it has been leaking oil ever since. So we know they exist, but our perspective over the phenomena has been rather static, right? So we kind of identify where they are from the maps, but we don't really know actually when. There is a huge knowledge gap about the basics of summary landslides, including where, when, and not to mention why. Um, so here, I want to argue uh, seismology, in particular, marine seismologists can help a lot. You know, here, what we're trying to do is to understand where, when, basically time and location. And as a seismologist, this is what we do. And I'm going to say something controversial yet brave is that we're actually the best doing location and timing. Now here, use a novel surface wave detector, we identified 85 seismic sources in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and they can generate coherent transcontinental surface wave fields. Uh, and here, I will try to show you that there's some marine landslides. Now, this is what I mean by coherent transcontinental surface wave fields. Each dot represents a, uh, a three-station subarray. The red square here shows you the uh, summary landslide uh, that we detected, and the color of the dots represents the surface wave arrival time. The arrows show the propagation direction. The thin lines are gray circle passes, and the left show the uncertainty. How did we get? How did we get this? Now we take advantage of the local, highly coherent intermediate surface waves. For example, when a wave propagating across a subarray, it will reach the stations at different times. Now, based on the time and also the location separation, we will be able to resolve the propagation direction and also the centroid arrival time. Very simple trigonometry. Now, if we do it independently at each subarray and then piece it together, we get a wave field. With a wave field, we will be able to locate the seismic source. And we're doing it differently than traditional approaches. We basically do a hybrid approach. Right, so doing a reprocessing and also inverse series, so which is part of model free and part of model dependent. There are many advantages of doing detection this way, but I want to point out the most important part is the method allows us to discover unknown unknowns, which are buried in the noise. 
So to understand the example source I showed you, we can look at the waveforms. So the most important part of this figure is that the durations of the surface waves lasted over 10 minutes. This is very long and very different compared to earthquake signals. Now on the right part, I'm showing you wave uh, record sections from earthquakes traveling, uh, generating <laughs> waves tra traveling through similar epicentral ranges. And as you can see, the durations are much, much shorter. To know the physical processes, we need to model it. Now, summary landslides or landslides are usually modeled as central single forces because the loading and unloading process is associated with the sliding. And because of that, we can assume the force histories as a boxcar. Now, following the assumption, we can model this event. And our model suggests the event propagated towards or slide towards the northeast direction. With an empirical scaling relationship, what we found is that this event likely displaced about 62 million tons of rocks or sediments. And as you can see, it is located near this edge of the continental slope where the topography is quite steep and likely facilitated the occurrence. But I also want to point out is currently, because of a lack of near-field instrumentation, our resolution is not good enough to do a direct comparison with detailed morpholo morphological features, so future work. This kind of event seems to occur without any precursors or uh, preceding earthquakes. And we identified 10 of them occurring in the northern part of the Gulf from 2008 to 2015. When earthquakes happen, they can trigger some rain landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. And here, an event occurred in the Gulf of California. And soon after its occurrence, we observe a source in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, these two panels share the same color bar. What you observe here is a second source occurred 1,500 kilometers later uh, away and 435 seconds later. And what this means is the occurrence of the summer landslide coincide with the surface waves from the earthquake. And because of the paucity of any seismic events in the Gulf of Mexico, this indicates the second one was dynamically triggered by the first one, not a random occurrence. I want to emphasize is that what we're observing here is not your typical chain reaction hazard in the near field where earthquake trigger landslides. The ground motion needs to be really large. What we're seeing here are two things separated by 1500 kilometers and the perturbation from the stress is minimum. That was not a rare event. We observed 75 dynamically triggered summer landslides in the Gulf of Mexico clustering in the northwestern part of the Gulf, where the basimetry is rather complex. Most of the triggering earthquakes are from the Pacific plate boundaries. And to plot the triggering pairs into distance versus time plot, we might gain more insight. Here, the horizontal axis is the separation distance, and the vertical axis is separation time. And the color represents main shock azimuth. To put things into perspective, we can plot them on top of phase moveouts. And the first thing we learn is this, these events were triggered, dynamically triggered by the passing surface waves indicated by three kilometers per second move out line. And they were triggered immediately or with a very short delay. Interestingly, we do not observe a magnitude cutoff at the lower end. This suggests maybe the peak dynamic strain was not the only triggering threshold that we need to consider here. We do observe an interesting distance limit that all the triggering earthquakes are within 40 degrees of the Gulf of Mexico. And this potentially indicates a frequency dependent triggering mechanism because the further away the earthquakes, the less high frequency ground motion they can generate at the Gulf. Now in total, we observe 85 events, 10 spontaneous, 75 dynamically triggered. The only thing we have more in the Gulf are the oil platforms, show as the yellow dots. On the left side, you see a lot of the uh, occurring sites of the summer landslides coincide with the active exploration leasing site locations. Now, what I want to say is this is actionable science, understanding the mechanisms of summer landslides in this region, which means why and how can help to mitigate the future potential hazard. So mechanically, for a seismically detectable summer landslide, it needs to move fast, move as a block, and move along a weak zone. The complex structured ocean basin and the six sediments here really set up the fundamentals. So maybe rapid sedimentation accumulation have created overly steep topography, which would lead to overpressurization of either water or oil. Gas hydrate is prevalent in the region and may be another uh, contributor. Or maybe weak oil layer or seepage pathways have been there 
to facilitate sliding surfaces. The dynamically triggered events are definitely due to the prolonged ground motion. This is based on the fact with getting, they don't get out. Now the prolonged ground motion will cause cyclic shearing, which while leads to plastic strain accumulation, effectively reduce material strength and eventually leads to the observed slides. Cyclic shearing can also enhance the permeability, which might have contributed as well. Now, what I want to say is all these hypotheses are testable if we have in situ observations. So even though these are dangerous, I do want to say we have a pathway to move forward. And in particular, seismology and marine seismology can help. And I want to say seismology is really at the forefront um, to make the world a better, better and safer place. For example, as Zhong Wang has showed you, now using global cable networks, we can understand the earth and ocean processes as at unprecedented details. And Marine has shown us that using passive seismic observations, we are able to monitor subsurface hydraulic systems at very high spatial and temporal resolution. Clara has shown us that using seismic observations, we will be able to understand the environmental forcing, which ultimately changes the shape of the surface of the, of the Earth. And lastly, uh, Danica has showed us seismic signals can be used to understand river systems, in particular, the bedrock, bed, bedrock loading system, which are very difficult or challenging to observe otherwise. And lastly, I want to say innovative seismic techniques can be used to study the environment and ultimately to benefit the society. Thank you. Great. Thank you for an excellent talk and for um, giving us that nice summary of the end of the session. Um, the, this has been a, a great uh, set of examples um, that everyone has presented. Before we move to the general discussion, um, do I have any questions for Wen Yuan? I have a question, uh, Jessica. Go for it. Go, Diego. Hey, Fan. How's it going? Good. How are you? Um, I'm good. So I, I guess I have two questions, but I, I think I, I want an answer to the first one more than, than the second one. The first one is, so those 10 landslides that you're saying are spontaneously triggered, really what that means is that they're not seismically triggered, but there's other mechanisms for triggering submarine landslides like storm waves or um, isopycnal flows and, and other kinds of stuff. So have you try to look at other mechanisms um, for those kinds of landslides? Well, excellent question. So I checked the, um, uh, we watched three models, tried to infer if there is any correlation with uh, storm activities. Uh, and that, that is negative for these 10 events. Um, but other than that, like you mentioned, there are lots of issues or not issues, lots of factors can play into um, the initiation processes, mm -hmm. which is really poorly known. And, my current guess is a lot of them are due to the existence of gas hydrate because they're very prevalent and they can act in a wide water depth range, but that is unconfirmed hypothesis. And I agree with you, many things could happen. Thanks, Ben. Great, and then we're gonna have a question from Donna. Yes, fabulous talk, Wenyuan, that was great. Um, I was curious if, um, any of the submarine landslides, either that you've studied or if you know of others, have been also um, detected on DOS cables? And if you think there are opportunities for kind of integration of the kind of seismic methods that you used and other kinds of seismology for, um, for characterizing these things. Excellent question. And thank you so much for bringing that up. I was hoping to have a chat with Jonwen afterwards. Um, and so the, the interesting part of the ones we have detected are mostly happening in deeper water. And um, the reason for that is for seismically detectable, they have to be relatively rigid to move as a block. Therefore, they have to have, have some history. So the DAS cables tend to be near shore, which are on top of unconsolidated sediments, which are much softer. Um, I, I, I think there might be mud flows near the coastal areas but that might not be the ones I have been detecting. And coming back to your notion is, if we are able to leverage observations you know, into the deep water through a much larger region, I think that's just excellent. And Zhong might have something to add. 
Right. Yes, he is about to. Great. Yeah. So uh, first, uh, what when I said totally makes sense. You know, the dust, the range may not reach where you you can observe this summer night slide. But of course, there are also summer night slide near coast where it's totally within the reach of dust. I just want to bring another topic that is submarine landslide is often what cause cut of telecom cables uh, in the ocean. And there are actually database, actually the, the, re, the way people first observe big submarine landslide is because of cut of submarine cables. So I think this is a, there is a great opportunity there of using data collected, you know, damages to cables collected by other uh, by the telecom industry, also using the kind of polarization sensing we are doing. Uh, you know, maybe it's not cutting the cable, but deforming the cable enough to produce a polarization change uh, to monitor summary analysis. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Great. So um, we're now, um, that, this was a really nice segue into the general discussion part of this session. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, questions can be asked of all of us because I am going to circle back to something that is in the Q and A that Emily Brodsky put in after the second talk, um, and that um, question I think is actually applicable to more than just the first two speakers. So her question or kind of comment and question: um, It seems like this approach is currently a bit like studying earthquakes by seismometers in the 1930s with sparse stations. There was a lot of promise to capture qualitatively new information real high precision time series, which cannot be accessed any other way, but there needs to be a concerted effort to get to the next step. For earthquakes, that was a serious investment in seismic networks. What does the next step look like in this environmental seismology? And I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if, um, who wants to take it first, if um, someone can jump in or, or we can do raised hands. Can we have more funding? <laughs> Yes, I can, I can add to this. I, so I think the points that Christine and Sarah raised earlier about needing more support for mixed and interdisciplinary data also apply very much here. Um, strengthening the infrastructure around support for training, instrument use, um, archiving and metadata standards, especially for mixed data types uh, and co-located data, and collaboration for interdisciplinary research to to use seismic data and um, kind of connect to relevant fields of expertise are all pretty critical. There's, I think, a, a strong need for bringing together seismic technical expertise with uh, process-based expertise for understanding some of the very complex systems that we're studying here. And, and there's there's big boundary, I think, for participation and in just using seismic data that is a hurdle for, for non-seismic researchers to get into using this stuff, so. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Danica said, um, some of the experience I had in even trying to compile this cross-site comparison is that there aren't really standards for best practices in terms of how to most effectively set up these sites or how to archive your data, process your data, um, make your data available, which meant that I basically needed to go from raw data and reproduce, make sure I could reproduce everyone's methods, re-download everyone's environmental data for each of their sites individually, um, even to just look at like, does a bigger wave shake the cliff more? Um, so I think establishment of some of those community standards can be really helpful to deal with this issue of the fact that there are still a very limited number of data sets that we even have to look at. Go ahead, Maureen. So I think I arrived a bit late in the game, but the critical zone observatory was such a cool uh, innovation for transdisciplinary research. Um, and I think I arrived late because I was still learning about the length scales of the processes I was looking into uh, in the, the monitoring the shadow structure. And I still think we're not yet to soil moisture, but there is definitely like, we're spanning greater length scale um, that CZO was uh, looking into, but it, it was inspiring. And I don't have any perspective on how, you know, things could be improved on that program, but something of that scale would be 
fantastic with seismic data. Or even permanent monitoring sites set up within the existing critical zones that have the full infrastructure and all of the other data that one might want to have to see what your seismic signals are telling you about. Can I add that? Yeah. So, so the last slide I had is because I'm really interested in collocating these measurements when they are not collocated. So looking back in the past, part of the goal I have is to use seismic uh, properties as proxies for these other data types that are not continuously recording since the 1990s or something. Uh, but collocation is key. And so maybe we'll find smart ways to learn from data types to collocate, like in SAR and GPS or GNSS. But there's definitely, if we could have something that would, you know, in the future deployments of these large arrays, um, the future of stage engaged, for instance, let's think about ways we can collocate these, uh, all of this together. Uh, so we're going to go to Wen Yuan and then John Wen is going to go next. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so I want to come back to what Emily just mentioned in the in the question part is now we're go beyond single stations for a while and the race seismology has really run, you know, revolutionized our understanding of a lot of processes like what John showed he uses thousands of like tens of thousands seismometers along the dash cable to do these things. And, and this is really one leverage that we can play with to understand these processes is by deploying or designing arrays that diffuse our purpose, right? So basically all we mirror as seismologists are location and time. And we have control over the seismometer locations. This is a great leverage. Um, and to understanding these processes, we should think of what we want to know because different array configurations are suited to study different processes and the resolution also depends on the overall footprint. Um, and so if we keep that in mind and potentially with the emerging technologies, we, you know, we do have a very great way to move forward. So um, it's actually also a follow up uh, with what Wen Yuan said, you know, at least for the submarine case, either it's a landslide or other processes of interest in, uh, to oceanographers. Uh, I think there is a two resources we should tap in to really make this scale up. Number one is uh, all those historical um, data that may be sensitive to uh, Navy or other uh, kind of uh, usage. Um, you know, maybe this committee, this uh, COSEC committee has some leverage or your sponsors have some leverage to say about that. But you know, there is a lot of very valuable data uh, for, uh, for studying the ocean. Uh, another one is to really expand their uh, fiber sensing arrays in the ocean. The instrument turns out may not be their biggest challenge. It's the fiber access is the biggest challenge. Again, this is a regulatory uh, domain there. Uh, people who own the fibers get permission to do it for telecommunication. They are not allowed to use it for research purpose. And uh, they need permissions from the regulatory agencies to say, yes, you can do it or you are required to do it. Again, maybe some of the sponsors of this uh, committee is able to help the, uh, the, the research community uh, about that. Um, so unfortunately, this committee does not have the ability to declassify Navy data. I will clarify that. But um, I am gonna use my, my power as moderator well, actually, I'm gonna let Donna ask a question and then I'll, I have a, another question after that. So Donna, do you wanna go? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for uh, fitting me in. I, I just had a question, uh, particularly for Zhang Wen along the lines of what we were just talking about. Um, uh, putting aside uh, the, the access to these data, what would be the, what's the maximum time series that's available for mini DOS cable? worldwide should the data be available. I, I think I saw in your last slide, you showed a time series that continued back to maybe 2009, but I was wondering if data, over what time periods data actually do exist, uh, if, that, if I've made myself very clear, thanks. Right, I, I don't think there's anything back to 2009. All the DAS experiments so far uh, goes back two years and most of them are short-term experiment. There hasn't been any 
real long-term operation of data arrays. So that's mostly again due to access to fiber. Usually for the research cables, when they are doing maintenance, you are able to put your DAS instrument, make a few weeks of measurement. And that largely limits what we can do, right? We can show, we can observe this and that, but we cannot show how it can make a real scientific impact to a particular uh, question. That's definitely one of the limitations. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, some of their polarization data measured by the telecom operators, uh, they use it and they throw it away. They never save it. So okay, that um, is my back. question because we have had these cables deployed over some time. If there were, if if those, if that information was stored over longer times yeah. by the companies, but no, unfortunately okay. uh, not. Right, yeah, they are you. interested in the data at very small time scales, and once they use it, they don't need it anymore. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to go to a question from the Q and A. Um, so Colton Luna has a question following on Emily's comment. It seems like the seismic approach up to now has been to catch up to the existing environmental data. What happens when seismic data surpasses the existing environmental data? Are the mechanisms for funding across directorates and stakeholders to create co-located experiments? Are, are there? I think the I think the word should be: Are there mechanisms for funding across directorates and stakeholders to create co-located experiments? Marine? I don't have an answer to the first one, but the latter. You know, one thing that I found challenging is that reading our geodetic measurement has uh, ties to NASA. And then solid earth um, stuff that I want to do is more tied to NSF um, and hydrology and not necessary geophysics. And so I don't know how to join these funding sources because it seems like there should be a common interest, but I don't know how to do this. And so maybe teaching us how to do this as an early career would be uh, valuable. I don't know when seismic data would surpass the other. I don't think they're surpassing. I think there's going to be nice proxies that we can learn from each other, and then we'll just need huge computers to store and process. Does anybody else want to comment? I guess Danica. I'll add that um, I've been involved in a research coordination network trying to look into DAS usage. Um, my my working group is looking at geomorphology, and I think one of the challenges for us is that DAS in particular is is very expensive. So if we're interested in co-installing, you know, the kinds of seismometers that Pascal already carries, that's not a problem. Um, there's stream gauges in most rivers. There's plenty of other uh, you know weather data, that kind of thing. Um, but if we're interested in using some of the most uh, high resolution cutting edge stuff like a DAS, that's, I think they're in the like $200,000 range to purchase one. Um, and, and rental is, is pretty prohibitively expensive, especially for sections that are, uh, I, I understand that some of the sections have higher, more funding available for these kinds of things than others. So I think kind of data sharing and instrument sharing uh, support is is a an important thing going forward for for use across fields. Does anyone else have a comment? I I actually so I wanted to kind of take to ask you guys on this as well in the you know because Danica brought up this RCN idea and I think in geophysics we can look to some really good examples of communities coming together to push for, for much bigger scale projects from, I mean, obviously Earthscope to geoprisms and margins to compress. And so is, is this community reaching the critical mass where they, they, they can do that or moving towards doing that? Um, and, you know, I realize that I'm asking, you know, five assistant professors whose time is maybe not best spent on that immediately, but is there a long-term vision forming um, for how to, um, you know, work across fields and how to develop infrastructure? You know, some of these mid um, mid-sized infrastructure projects and things like that. Is is the community moving that way? Do you, does anybody have an opinion or comments on that? 
There's a metric. Oh, sorry, Winyan. I don't know how the. Oh, no, go. Go, mo, mo, go you go yeah. because you had been yeah. starting to say something before, and then when you're in, go next. That's okay. So Danica has led a lot of the AGU uh, sessions. So I think a metric to see how, you know, the growth of that community is by the success of these environmental uh, seismology session at SS and AGU. Danica has led a lot of them, and so I think eventually, uh, the, the the community is there. So that that's all I wanted to say. Um, so I want to echo back first. You know, Marie made an excellent point. If if more people work on this, then there there will be the base to to use the infrastructures. But I also want to point out is we not only need to have the user base, we need to be able to offer something other direct observations cannot offer. Um, and I I would uh, say at this moment a lot of our um, studies are still in the validation uh, stage. For example, my own I. You know, I'm, I think there are similar landslides, but I have not validated this. So I, I think once we're reaching a relatively more mature stage that our results are established, like what Christine did earlier for uh, the panel one is if, if it is already a robust technique to, to offer things that other observations cannot, then that is a better way to move forward with a very uh, clear strategic goal. Um, um, so, so I guess the idea is we 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 not only need to uh, confirm what has you know what what have happened, but need to offer um, things that other observations cannot provide. Great, thank you. When you're in, um, I'm going to add in two comments that have come in in the Q and A. So the first one is from Emily Brodsky, and she is partly responding to Colton Lina's question. Um, and Emily says that it is possible that seismology will motivate a new set of questions that have not yet been asked in allied fields because they have never had the high temporal resolution of seismology. It is going to take a concerted effort to explain the capabilities and get these questions asked. Um, and I think that's a really nice follow on from the comment that Wen Yuan just made about being in the validation stage. Um, and then uh, below that, there's a comment from Cindy Ebinger um, who points out that industry data and partnerships could be very helpful connecting with DOE and offshore ONG, which I'm not quite sure what that one means, but, and wind farm industry could be critical at this stage. Um, so uh, Danica, I'm gonna do, um, let, have Danica say something. Um, and then, uh, and then I know that Diego, I think also has a question that he wants to ask. So go ahead, Danica. So I, I wanted to respond to uh, both Emily's and, and Marina Munyan's points that uh, I think kind of speaking from my experience in running these AGU sessions on um, I think one of the things that I and a few of us have highlighted is is this interdisciplinary collaboration I I'm seeing a lot of very very advanced work happening from seismologists that isn't really making it into the process communities because geomorphologists are are watching seismology talks and don't understand what we're seeing. Um, I've been running these AGU sessions for I think three years now, and I struggle to understand some of the talks. They look very exciting, and it's hard to take away like true process information, right? And there's a good chance that we are capturing very exciting new signals. To Emily's point, that have not been picked up yet. The temporal resolution is unbelievable. I mean, for sediment transport, we're talking like point measurements with a bucket, basically, right? Compared to every like sub second samples. So um, I think the information is there, but I think there's a communication barrier between process-based fields and the seismology community that really needs to be overcome before we can take advantage of that joint expertise. Great, thank you. And Sarah is going to jump in. And I think our other um, speakers from both the first session and the upcoming session should feel free to jump in at this point as well. So take it away, Sarah. I just wanted to add that there's some analogies, um, like your regulatory pro or issues uh, dealing with fiber optic cable access. Um, we share, uh, well, I think we will share considerable regulatory issues as near surface geophysics moves to drone transport of instruments. And I think there's a lot of value in community organization so that it's not just, here's one researcher who wants to access this cable, right? But 
some, you know, the community as a whole can talk to regulators in a different way than any single one researcher. And I don't have the solution on how to do that. But I think that, you know, there are a lot of common issues for all of us going forward that will benefit simply from, you know, meetings like this and community building so that we can deal with, with people outside our subdisciplines on these issues. John Wen. Yeah, I absolutely agree with uh, Sarah uh, on that. Um, but I, I also think that just to come back to Cindy's uh, question a little bit earlier, I think the, 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 there are the environmental geophysics or, or, or science, there is a fundamental research side and it has more stuff related to practical applications. Uh, I, I, you know, than many of the other, you know, for example, deep earth study, right? So uh, I think this is where we need um, help to connect with this, all these other agencies with practical interest, right? Like I, I, can, I can give you an example recently when we were working on some of the DAS on hydrology kind of uh, research, and we were able to connect with Los Angeles Water and Power Department, and they are still kind of testing and see what you can contribute, but that's a positive step, right? And, and it would be nice is, as it was Cindy mentioned about wind farm, offshore wind farm, right? And the DOE, all these uh, agencies or industries have a practical application and see the value here. Uh, and then I think that's when uh, the, this kind of community will start to take off. I think just to add something in the same vein of what folks have been saying um, is I think a lot of what we've talked about are, is still focused on what are the signals that we can actually see and we've yet to go towards what are then given the signals that we can see what are the disciplinary questions that we are then able to ask and so I think that that's really the connection that we need to like look to strengthen through these types of partnerships that everyone's talking about. Great. Well, th this has been a great discussion. We have maybe one minute left. And Diego, if you think we can get this, um, Diego has been asking to ask a question that's going to take us in another direction. So no, in our last minute for this uh -huh. session. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to say quickly, there are two remaining questions in the Q&A, but they are speaker specific. And so um, uh, in the break, if the speaker, if those speakers could address them, that would be great. Okay, go Diego. So I, actually, we drifted in this direction, which is Fine. So one of the main goals of this meeting was to explore that connection between, you know, the seismologists and the users, so to speak, in, in these other disciplinary fields. And what I've heard is a lot of like seismology starts out in the periphery and starts to nibble into this other disciplinary field. So my question specifically is for, for, for Zhang Wen, because thermometry is well inside of physical oceanography. So I'm kind of wondering what the response was from oceanographers to your work and what your thoughts are on getting physical oceanographers to do seismology instead of seismologists doing oceanography? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We had concerns in the very beginning, right? Uh, uh, but I think one key issue is that their thermometry approach is marrying something at a different scale than some of their current approach. It turns out the oceanography community was uh, very welcoming to this uh, new development. They, they see that this add value to what they are already marrying, which is kind of point-wise, very accurate measurement, but we are doing long baseline average measurement that kind of average over some of the smaller scale um, you know, complexities that they may not care about for particular problems. And then because of that interest, I'm actually quite hopeful that there could be a concerted effort, right? For example, if we need more hydrophones, <laughs> if the Navy allows, if we can put more hydrophones in the ocean to do thermometry, well, the same hydrophone can be used for seismology as well. If you put a hydrophone in the sea floor, you need cables to connect the data to the land. Well, can that cable then be used for that or some of the other research, right? So I start to see there are actually quite a common interest there, but of course, this is still in the very beginning, and we need to be able to break some of the barriers, uh, you know, to understand what each other's interests are and what's, what's each other's needs uh, in this case. But a very good suggestion. Great. Well, this was a wonderful discussion. This is a nice way to end. Thank you to all of our panelists um, for giving your talks, really excellent talks, and also for this great discussion. It was very thought-provoking. Welcome back, everybody. 
So my name is Steve Naram, and I'll be moderating this last session. Our final panel will look into some examples of satellite gravimetry and hydrological applications. Our speakers are Matt Rodell and Bridget Scanlon. Uh, each of these speakers will give a 15 minute talk with a few minutes for some questions, followed by a discussion with both speakers at the end. So let's begin with uh, Matt Rodell. So Matt is the Acting Deputy Director for Earth Sciences for Hydrosphere, Biosphere, and Geophysics at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. He is also a member of the science team for NASA's Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment follow-on. And he is co-lead of the Mass Change Designated Observable Study uh, on re Research and Application Team. He leads the Global Land Data Assimilation System and and also projects focused on monitoring groundwater storage changes, mapping and forecasting drought and wetness and detecting climate related variations in the global water cycle. So Matt, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, okay, bear with me for a moment while I get my uh, presentation started. It's a multi-step process here. Uh, okay, wow. Well full screen and then stop sharing and slideshow. Okay, how's that look? Can you see my full screen, Steve? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. So I'll be talking about uh, the application of satellite gravimetry for water resources monitoring. And Let's see if I can get this to move forward. Here we go. Um, so let me just provide some motivation here. Um, if we look at how we monitor the water cycle, uh, and I'll be talking mostly about uh, terrestrial water storage and the water cycle and, and monitoring that with satellite gravimetry. Um, our our ground-based monitor, monitoring the water cycle, um, we look at several variables. So for instance, rain and snowfall in the upper left here. This shows an example of a snow tell site uh, in the mountains in Colorado uh, with various instruments. Um, the top middle is, is an example of measuring um, the stage in a river from which you can infer uh, river flow. Uh, top left is um, uh, shows a weighing lysimeter and an eddy covariance flux tower, both of which are used for measuring evapotranspiration. And then we have soil moisture, snowpack, and groundwater monitoring across the bottom. Um, all of these uh, require a, a, a quite a bit of labor to install the systems or to go out and make the measurements. Um, that they're expensive to maintain, and of course, you need to have access um, to the site where you want to make these measurements. So, uh, so as a result, it's it's basically impossible to have measurement stations everywhere on Earth. Uh, you know, continually and, and in, in all the places to really represent uh, uh, the water cycle across the earth. Um, this shows some examples of some of the um, in situ measurement networks that, that we have. The top left is the Global Telecommunications System Meteorological Stations. Um, and you can see the list of the variables that are measured at these um, does not include groundwater or soil moisture, for example. And if you look at some of these areas like northern um, Africa, you can see there, there are huge distance, it's just distances between these dots, um, so really not completely representative of, of the entire world uh, outside of uh, the, the well-developed, uh, wealthier countries. Uh, the lower left shows uh, the river flow observations that are archived at the Global Runoff Data Center in Germany. Uh, the, the warmer colors indicate uh, stations where it's been a longer time since the since a record was made available. And for example, the Nile River, one of the most important rivers in, uh, in Africa, the, the most recent observation you can get is, is from about 1983. Uh, when we look at groundwater monitoring, um, it's okay in the US. You can see uh, the USGS groundwater climate response network sites in the lower right, um, pretty dense in the Northeastern US and not so dense uh, in much of the rest of the US. But that's a lot better than it is in the rest of the world in the upper right. Um, these are the stations um, that are archived by the Global Runoff Monitoring Network uh, it, in, um, in the Netherlands, uh, and they do not even make the, the raw data freely available. 
So the issues here, are, as I said, are um, you know installing and maintaining these stations, but also um, there are political issues, uh, you know, countries that don't want to share their data. And of course, um, even if there are data, um, there are formatting issues and making them you know available in a centralized location. So that's sort of the uh, the motivation for satellite remote sensing. And this shows the current fleet of NASA's Earth observing uh, satellites. Um, many of these uh, circled here are relevant to hydrology, and I'm going to be focusing on Grace and Grace follow on, which you can see in the, in the top middle there. So, what makes uh, Grace and Grace follow on different? So, Grace is the gravity recovery and climate experiment. And whereas most satellite based observations are looking down at our Earth and making measurements of various wavelengths of the EM spectrum, shown in the upper right there. Um, and these uh, these can be related to various uh, quantities uh, of interest, um, but they're limited in what they can do. You can't see below the first few centimeters of the, the snow canopy soil column um, using this type of a measurement. Graces and grace follow-on are different um, because they're actually measuring the gravity field. They're not actually uh, looking down um, and because of that, they're able to uh, we're able to infer changes in terrestrial water storage at all levels um, down to the base of the deepest aquifer. The way this works is uh, is Grace and Grace follow on um, each of these missions was actually two satellites, uh, two identical satellites, one following the other, and or initial orbit uh, altitude of about 485 kilometers above the Earth. And they're about 200 kilometers apart. And every five seconds, they use a K band microwave, and then in the case of Grace Follow on a laser ranging system to make a measurement of the distance between the satellites uh, with an accuracy of about the size of a red blood cell, um, or, or even better with the, the laser ranging. Um, so as these uh, satellites orbit around the Earth, uh, as they come to a, a mass anomaly, which, which means there's also a gravitational anomaly. Um, the, the top panel there, the first satellite sort of gets pulled forward um, by this gravitational anomaly and the distance between the satellites increases uh, as, the, as they pass over the, the, the mountain range. Um, the, the first satellite sort of gets held back and the second satellite speeds up and the distance becomes shorter and then things even out again as they, as they pass over. Um, because these uh, observations are so precise uh, with this, this micron level um, uh, distance ranging. Um, we can not only measure or infer changes uh, in the orbits caused by um, by these static uh, mass and gravitational anomalies like mountain ranges, but also uh, changes um, in time or, or changes in the temporal gravity field um, caused by mass movements around the Earth. So um, if we can then account for uh, the atmospheric mass variations using um, measurements of, of surface pressure and, uh, and atmospheric models, and also account for uh, move those effects, what's left is changes in the gravity field um, over the land that are mostly caused by changes in terrestrial water storage. So terrestrial water storage is the sum of all the groundwater soil moisture, snow, and surface waters. And on the top here, I'm showing a time series um, based on in situ observations in Illinois. Um, the blue shows the, uh, the, the time series of um, relative levels of groundwater. Um, and then the red is uh, soil moisture and the white is snow. Um, and these are stacked on top of each other so that the top contour is the total truster water storage. And the changes in the total truster water storage are what we infer from the grace and grace follow on uh, measurements. Um, I'm circling here um, in yellow uh, a drought in the Midwest at first, and then on the right, a uh, um, very wet year when there's flooding in the Mississippi. And you can see that there's uh, not only seasonal variability, but interannual variability in this total truster water storage. Um, to see what, what we get from Grace and Grace follow on, if you look at the bottom right, this is an animation of monthly observations of terrestrial water storage anomalies, meaning uh, relative to the long-term mean uh, terrestrial water storage. So at each location, um, if it's blue, that means there's more water than normal, and if it's red, that means there's less water than, than normal. 
if you just focus on a, a particular region, for example, the Amazon, uh, you can see that, that there's a, a seasonal cycle, um, but there's also uh, this interannual variability. And these again are uh, equivalent heights of water in centimeters uh, in the lower right there. So it's all, all relative to the, the long-term mean. If we remove that seasonal cycle and then fit a linear trend at each, each location on earth, um, uh, using all the data, or in this case, we use data from GRACE from 20, 2002 to 2016, um, we, can, um, we can map the long-term rate of change of terrestrial water storage at, at all the locations across the land. And then the question is, um, which of these apparent trends in terrestrial water storage are just natural variability, and which ones may be caused by uh, human, human actions or human water mismanagement? and which ones may be associated with climate change. Um, one of the first trends we zeroed in on uh, when we had GRACE data um, back in 2009 was, uh, was this big bullseye in Northern India. Uh, and it turns out this is caused by uh, farmers pumping a lot of groundwater to irrigate their crops. Um, they pump the water out of the aquifer, they, they spread it across the, the farmland. Most of that water evaporates and you end up with a net loss of water in the region. Um, we estimated based on GRACE that the rate of change of that water loss in this uh, the region that's outlined here is about 19.3 cubic kilometers per year. Um, to put that in perspective, the, uh, the largest surface water reservoir in the US, Lake Mead, holds about 30 or 35 cubic kilometers of water so in, in just about a, a year and a half in Northern India, they lose about um, one Lake Mead worth of water, which is, which is a lot. Um, and this sort of opened some eyes when we first published this back in 2009, um, and uh, India has become much more aware and more serious about the issue. And what's interesting is that it was not, um, you know, the fact that they, they weren't really aware of this and paying attention was not an issue of data scarcity. Um, this is a map of wells. Um, all the little dots are well locations. The problem is these data were not publicly available, um, and so so people couldn't do the sort of scientific analyses to to uh, to understand what was going on. Uh, this is the map again of the the trends in terrestrial water storage or apparent trends. And if you're interested, um, back in uh, 2018 we published this paper in in Nature where we tried to explain all the major trends that we saw in the GRACE data and, uh, and then attribute them either to uh, natural variability, direct human impacts, or, or possible uh, climate change impacts. So changing gears a little bit here, um, you may have noticed that the, the GRACE and GRACE follow-on data resolution is pretty low. The spatial resolution is low. The temporal resolution is about monthly. Um, and there's also a significant latency. Um, typically, we don't get the, the nominal grace, grace following fields until two to five months after real time. So to deal with that, um, one of the things we do, and, and we do this for, for many other variables in hydrology, is we use uh, something called a land service model, which is like the land component of a weather or climate um, prediction system, except more or less optimized uh, for, for terrestrial hydrology. And it's it's something that it's a it's a computer model that divides the world up into a grid, um, and then it may uh, divide that each grid square into into sub subgrids. And in uh, in this case, um, based on the the land cover type, and it uses a system of physical equations to solve uh, for the water and energy cycle um, uh, components, um, the the uh, the fluxes and states of the water and energy cycle. Um, the inputs are things like precipitation and solar radiation. Um, outputs are things like uh, snow water equivalent, soil moisture, runoff, and evapotranspiration that are not necessarily easy to measure. And as I say, we use this, uh, we use these land surface models for data integration. So, so we have a lot of observations um, from, from satellites and ground-based networks that are not necessarily exactly what we want to, to know, or there may be gaps in the, in, the, in the observations. And so we can integrate the data within the model and sort of fill in these gaps. So we do this by, by uh, inter comparison and optimal merging of the available fields. Um, we then use things like precipitation, solar radiation as inputs to the model to drive the model forward. We call that forcing. 
Um, we also do a process called data simulation where we optimally merge um, an observation, like in this case, snow cover, um, with the, the simulated snow water equivalent in the model. Um, uh, snow water equivalent is much more valuable variable than, than uh, snow cover from the MODIS sensor on the Terra and Aqua satellites because uh, snow cover just tells you if the, the existence of snow, it's either it's binary, either no, uh, snow or no snow. Um, uh, whereas uh, uh, snow water equivalent tells you about the amount of water in the snowpack uh, available for water resources. And then we can use ground-based observations to validate the output. So we've been doing this um, with the GRACE data for about um, more than 10 years now. Um, and we're, we've been applying this to develop, uh, for example, drought and wetness maps. So uh, the upper left here shows a typical um, uh, Grace terrestrial water storage anomaly map over the U.S. This is from May 2014. Uh, we assimilate that into the model. The model allows us to uh, spatially and temporally downscale it and also um, bring the information up to near real time. And so uh, we get outputs, for example, uh, surface soil moisture, root zone soil moisture, and groundwater across the bottom. And what we've done here is we've used a long-term simulation of the model going back to 1948 to develop a climatology. And then for each location, um, what we're plotting here is, is the wetness percentile relative to that climatology. So, for example, in a, at a given location, um, if it's in the fifth percentile of that location, that means it's, um, it's only been drier than that um, at that location in the same time of year, 5% um, of the time in, in the past 70 years or so. Um, so, so these are, uh, we've been, we developed these about 10 years ago. We make them available at um, nasagrace.unl.edu. And they're actually one of the inputs to the U.S. Drought Monitor, which you may have seen in the back of USA Today. It's, it's sort of the premier drought map for the U.S. Um, one nice thing about our maps is they divide up the, divide things up into three levels, a surface, root zone, and soil moisture, and groundwater. Um, and we also account for wetness, not just, uh, not just dryness. Uh, one thing we've done recently is also uh, develop a forecast capability. Uh, so on the right there, we're showing um, uh, on the top our, uh, our forecast for root zone soil moisture and initialized on February 1st, um, valid for March 1st. And then the lower right shows the actual March 1st soil moisture conditions. Um, and so we can see we did pretty well. Um, it's a little wetter across the, uh, the, the mid-Atlantic than, than we expected. Uh, but otherwise, a uh, pretty good result. The other thing we're doing now is um, is doing the gray state assimilation at the global scale. Uh, so this animation shows uh, in the top left the model running in uh, the open loop, which means before we assimilate the gray data. Uh, the upper right are the uh, grace and grace follow-on observations, and you can see that the the spatial resolution is is quite a bit coarser with the grace observations. Um, and then when we assimilate the GRACE observations into the model, you get the, the uh, maps on the, on the lower right. Uh, so you can see it maintains the patterns seen in the GRACE observations, but also the, the, has the higher uh, spatial resolution um, uh, of the model, which, which is attributed to higher resolution um, inputs, such as precipitation, solar radiation, um, vegetation type, soil type, et cetera. So, um, so in summary, as I said, uh, uh, it's expensive and difficult to, to make ground-based observations around the world. It's basically impossible. Um, and that's why we um, use remote sensing to, to fill in these gaps. Uh, the Grace and Grace follow-on missions um, provide a unique type of observations. Um, there's no other way to measure total terrestrial water storage from space. Um, these terrestrial water storage storage observations have been used to identify uh, areas of increasing and decreasing uh, freshwater availability, which we've attributed to natural variability, direct human impacts, or climate change. Um, we use land service models to, to integrate various types of observations and fill in spatial and temporal gaps, and also uh, bring the data up to near real time. Um, we've been doing this with the Grace and Grace follow-on data enabling us to uh, map and forecast wetness and drought conditions. And, uh, and uh, as Steve uh, alluded to earlier, um, we're now studying architectures uh, for the next generation 
of, uh, of mass change mission that would be the successor to Grace Follow-On, which launched in, uh, in 2018. Um, as re recommended by the National Academy's uh, Dec Decadal Earth Survey in Earth Sciences in, uh, in 2017. So thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Uh, we have time for uh, one question. The, there was a question in the chat about what is the spatial resolution of Grace FO. You could answer that real quick. Yeah, so the spatial re resolution varies um, depending on whether you're looking at, you know, the, the low latitudes near the equator, or near the poles. Um, generally, it's on the order of about 100 to 150,000 square kilometers at mid-latitude. So you're talking about the size of the state of Illinois, for example. Hey, Matt, we'll, why don't you hang around and we'll have more questions after Bridget's talk. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Bridget Scanlon, and she is a senior research scientist in the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on the evaluation of the impact of climate variability and land use change on groundwater recharge application and numerical models for simulating variable saturated flow and transport and controls on nitrate contamination in aquifers. So Bridget, I'll let you take it away. Can you see uh, the full screen now, right? Yes, yeah, we okay. see it great. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, comparing gray satellite data with uh, uh, monitoring and modeling data. And I'm going to focus on the US where we have quite a lot of data uh, for comparison. I would like to acknowledge the other people working with me on this project. Ashraf Ratib was the postdoc and uh, uh, it was a collaboration between US Geological Survey people, Don Poole, Lenny Conoco, Ward Sanford, and the NASA folks, uh, David Weiss and Himanshu Save, and Alex on in our, uh, at the university. Um, this is uh, funded by uh, USGS and NSF, and we had uh, week-long uh, programs each summer where we uh, sat together and, and discussed, and I think it benefited both groups uh, uh, to try to better understand uh, grace from the NASA folks and then um, uh, vice versa. Uh, so as Matt uh, provided a great introduction to gray satellite data, and I'm just going to follow up on that then. So we're talking about water storage, um, which represents the balance between inputs and outputs. And a lot of emphasis on water scarcity these days. And so reductions in storage can result from a reduction in input, such as related to drought or groundwater, um, or, uh, and an increase in output related to uh, irrigation pumpage or things like that. Um, so Matt uh, mentioned the traditional approaches that we use for monitoring storage. Um, and groundwater is a big component of total water storage in many systems. And so looking at groundwater levels and uh, multiplying those then by a storage coefficient to estimate groundwater storage. But there's a lot of uncertainty in storage coefficients between shallow, unconfined aquifers near the land surface where storage coefficients could be like 0.1 to 0.3 um, to deeper confined aquifers where it could be a, a couple of orders of magnitude less. And so when we have wells going through both, then it's very difficult to figure out what the water level change means in terms of storage. Um, regional models are used by, have been developed by USGS state agencies, many different groups to look at groundwater storage and uh, traditionally looking at uh, uh, recharge estimates and then uh, subtracting discharge to estimate uh, groundwater storage. And we think that these are very accurate because they're high resolution, but that's not necessarily the case. And as aquifers develop, as I show in the, this slide uh, here, um, um, so um, this is uh, from Lenny Kanaka's work. Um, initially, most of the water that, that's pumped out of an aquifer comes from storage. So uh, storage declines rapidly. But over time, as those cones of depression uh, expand, then you capture more water from surface water or increase recharge. So this is important to understand. And on the right, then, 
I show, um, you know, when you drill a, a well near a stream, uh, initially the water is coming from aquifer storage, and then over time you may be capturing uh, some of the stream flow. And this will be important when we try to understand graze data later. So uh, Lenny Kanakaw developed these maps of uh, brown water depletion in the major aquifers in the US. And this is uh, extends from the period 1900 to 2008. And so you can see uh, well-known hotspots of depletion, the Central Valley minus 145 cubic kilometers over this time, um, Arizona alluvial systems 100, uh, the High Plains um, minus 340, and Mississippi embayment minus 180. And slight rises in the Northwest, Columbia Plateau and Snake, and very little change along the East Coast. So this has been a great uh, framework uh, to look at the GRACE data. So I'm just going to look at three basic questions. How reliable are the data when we compare it with groundwater levels or regional models? What's causing the storage changes? Is it climate, human use, or both, like Matt was talking about globally? And then how can we use these results to move towards more sustainable water management? So we use different GRACE solutions uh, from UT Center of Space Research or JPL or sparkler harmonic solutions. And we look at climate impacts with detailed data in the US and human water use. Um, and then we estimate groundwater storage by subtracting those other components, snow, surface water, and soil moisture from the products that Matt was describing. And then we compared the data with uh, uh, regional models that the USGS and other groups had developed in different aquifers with the groundwater level data up to 23,000 wells. And then I won't have time to talk about comparisons with the global models. Um, so this is the uh, total uh, change in uh, trends in total water storage from 2002 through 2017. So over this 15 year period, you can see the reds are declines in storage in the Southwest and South Central US. Um, yellows are buffer zones uh, with almost no change. And then the greens and blues are slight increases in storage in the humid East or in the Northern and Northwestern regions. Um, and then when we subtract those other components, we end up with the groundwater storage. So these numbers are very similar to the numbers we saw for total water storage, um, just slightly less related to soil moisture storage impacts. So, uh, you know, declines here of almost uh, 30 cubic kilometers in the Central Valley, 40 in the Central and Southern High Plains, uh, an increase of uh, 20 in the uh, Northern High Plains, Nebraska area, very little change in the Mississippi embayment and slight increases here. So if we compare those data then with what uh, Lenny Kanaka had in his earlier uh, work, you can see that the biggest difference really, I mean, is similar in the Central Valley between the two, even though the time periods are slightly di are, are different. This is 15 year time period. This is the most recent eight year time period from his work. Uh, but the declines are similar in the Central Valley and um, very little change or slight rise over this period in Arizona from um, um, managed aquifer recharge and uh, Colorado water. Um, similar declines, 40 cubic kilometers. And when you go into detail, you can see that this refers to mostly in the Central and Southern High Plains. But the biggest difference and what was really surprising to us was the Mississippi embayment. We have almost no change in storage and they have a hundred times greater depletion in storage from the regional models. So who's right? You know, so we have to duke it out. <laughs> it gets quite complicated, um, uh, but I'll try to show some data to, um, uh, you know, this was uh, an older model and uh, is it only 40 uh, stream, uh, streams within the model? So underestimated the stream capture, like I spoke about earlier. And so most of the water may not be coming from storage. Recharge was estimated from the literature. And so there were a lot of um, issues and uh, they are now updating the model and improving it. Uh, but I think that shows where Grace can question uh, our uh, thinking and um, you know, and then help us uh, reevaluate. 
So here I'm showing comparisons uh, with the groundwater levels. Uh, this is in the northern high plains. So we saw a trend of about 20 cubic kilometers. Was this, is it really a trend? I mean, do we expect it to continue into the future? It's really just interannual variability. Um, and uh, over this time period, the, the linear trend uh, comes up positive. But at different time periods, you get different trends. The central and southern high plains then a decline in storage. And uh, this we're well aware of because there's very little recharge and there's no surface water. Uh, San Joaquin Tulare in the Central Valley declines. Very good correspondence between grace in uh, black and uh, the groundwater levels in many of these systems. So a correlation of 0.95 here. Um, and then the Mississippi embayment, um, you know, groundwater levels averaging, uh, increasing and decreasing over time. So generally good quality comparison with groundwater levels, and I'm not going to go into the details of all of these systems, uh, but basically a good qualitative uh, correspondence between the GRACE uh, time series and groundwater level data for each of the aquifers. Um, so we also compared with the uh, regional models, and this is the northern high plains. The time period of overlap is pretty limited, but you can see good correspondence, generally good correspondence there. Southern high plains, uh, the um, uh, gray state is more dynamic and the model is more uh, uniform. And then the big discrepancy that we found in the Mississippi embayment system, where gray suggests it's flat and uh, the model suggests declines. So to evaluate whether it's a true trend or it's just interannual variability, we compared the trends uh, to reconstructed grace interannual variability over the past 100 years, uh, Humphreys based on Humphreys data. And then we calculate the trend to interannual variability. And where the trends exceed two to three standard deviations of interannual variability, we feel like they are reliable. And this occurs mostly in the uh, uh, Central Valley and the Central and Southern High Plains region. Um, so then, so we've looked at the reliability by comparing water levels and regional models. Now I want to look at the causes of the change. And here we are comparing GRACE total water storage with the US drought monitor data and cumulative precipitation anomaly. And uh, so you can see the 2007-9 drought and 12 to 15 drought declines in storage corresponding to the US drought monitor. Um, so this is uh, the Sacramento Valley and the San Joaquin in very high correlations with the US drought monitor. So drought has a big impact on storage there. And uh, then the uh, Arizona alluvium, um, Northern High Plains, um, uh, poor correspondence here with the US drought monitor, uh, maybe because of uh, surface water irrigation. And then very little drought in the humid Eastern US, um, and uh, then uh, drought in the Southern High Plains and good uh, uh, Southern uh, Texas region and good correspondence with grace. Uh, so the Southwest and South Central region drought seems to be pretty important. Um, and the last thing then is the land use change. And we focused on irrigation in these different aquifers, uh, Central Valley, Snake, uh, Columbia, High Plains, and Mississippi. Um, so 2010 was a wet year in the Central Valley and 2015 was a dry year. So you would think that uh, pumpage, uh, would, uh, that irrigation would increase during drought, but actually the total water use decreases during drought because of land fallowing. And the different colors, the light blue represents surface water use, the dark blue represents groundwater. So when you go from a wet year to a dry year in the Central Valley, you increase groundwater pumpage uh, and so you go from 70% surface water during a wet year to almost 70% groundwater. And this is uh, one of the major reasons for the reduction in storage. Um, I never realized that, that uh, they pump more groundwater in the Mississippi embayment than they do in the Central Valley for irrigation. And, and that's why it's really shocking that uh, we don't see uh, total water storage depletion. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, they are capturing perennial surface water in this humid region. And, um, and that can explain the region. So then um, I am not going to go into detail on the others, but uh, what can we do uh, to make water resources more sustainable in the future? And I think where we have access to surface water, um, such as the California and um, Arizona and um, other regions, 
Conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater is very important. Um, and inefficient surface water irrigation is similar to managed aquifer recharge. Um, and if we're using groundwater, we need a very efficient system and, um, and now increasing managed aquifer recharge in different regions. Uh, in areas uh, with uh, no surface water availability, like the high plains, you just have to use a very efficient uh, groundwater irrigation and um, minimize uh, pumpage. So uh, trying to uh, show how we compared um, GRACE data with uh, groundwater monitoring and uh, regional models and how it helps uh, to constrain, I think, the regional models. And the bottom line is we need to use everything we can put our hands on to try to understand how these systems are working. And I think GRACE is proving useful in the US. And I think the USGS in the future will use uh, GRACE to constrain their regional models. And then it can also help us uh, develop more sustainable water management programs. So um, thanks very much. Uh, and this is the, the group uh, that were funded and we had summer uh, week-long summer sessions um, uh, to work on this topic for the last couple of years. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes, we have time for a few questions. <clears throat> I'll read. Uh... I'll read a few questions here from the chat. So the first one from Patricia is, does GRACE data do equally well for estimating water storage in continental interiors versus the edges of the continent, e.g. the Florida and Texas coast? And does aquifer shape matter? Um, I can, uh, I can uh, try to address that. I, I, the, ma the new MassCon solution tries to help with the, the issues uh, with large gradients along the coast it, uh, and corrects for those. But uh, uh, Florida is uh, problematic and uh, uh, we had differences between the Center for Space Research and JPL data in uh, Florida. Um, we're working with uh, Himanshu Savi and uh, others at JPL. So um, Florida is uh, difficult. Um, uh, you know, the northern high plains, the Nebraska is an ideal uh, aquifer uh, shape uh, for grace. The Central Valley is not ideal because it's north-south and uh, um, it's uh, small. Uh, so the bigger the aquifer, the better, and uh, the more round uh, spherical shape or rounded, the, the better also. I don't know if Matt wants to add anything. No, I think you covered it, Bridget. <laughs> Okay, we have another question here from Rosemary. Uh, she says, great work, Bridget. How do you go about getting the estimate that you need for a storage coefficient to go from water level measurements to change in storage? Uh, excellent question. So um, the storage coefficient doesn't affect the correlation between gray storage and groundwater level storage. It just affects the, the position of the line uh, in the graph. And uh, so you can back calculate an effective storage by correlating ground, uh, median groundwater levels for the aquifers with uh, the GRACE uh, storage. Um, or you can see what uh, they have indicated uh, from regional models, what the average storage coefficient is. And either way, we kind of got similar uh, results, but we worked with uh, Ginny McGuire and many other people on these regional models. And um, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a career. All right, well, now I'd like to uh, bring Matt back into the discussion so we can have a kind of a group discussion here. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you can type your questions into the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, but as moderator, I'm going to ask the first question of, of both Matt and Bridget, which is, uh, uh, you know, we've all been involved in these GRACE measurements as applied to hydrology for a long time. And I know uh, early on uh, that really the hydrologic community didn't really accept the GRACE measurements. I think they were so different from what they were used to. And I'm wondering now, here we are um, 20 years later, do you feel like the hydrologic sciences community has embraced the, this satellite gravity data? Or do you feel like we still have uh, to uh, convince them to, to make use of it? I can take a stab at that. So I, I think most of the convincing was done in probably the first 10 years of, of grace. And then um, 
uh, I remember one of the important things was Bridget and I worked on um, convincing the the members of the Grace Science team to produce a, a gridded Grace product. And there was some resistance to that at first. Um, some of the geodesists, geodesists felt like if they put a product out there that it would be misused by the community. And that's <laughs> not necessarily incorrect, but I think in order to, to have people embrace it, um, which they eventually did, I think having that sort of uh, standard product uh, made available without, you know, needing to have a geodesist as a collaborator, I think that was one of the keys to, um, to, to getting more people, more hydrologists using GRACE data and, and getting more comfortable with it. Um, like I said, there still is some definitely some misuse of, of the data, but at this point, I would say that it's definitely accepted by the hydrologic community. And, I, and the fact that it was so highly, you know, a mass change mission was so highly ranked in the National Academy of Sciences Decadal Survey in 2017, a lot of that was because of what you know, GRACE did for hydrology. Um. So, so, Steve, I'll just add a little bit to that. I mean, I was one of those skeptics uh, early on. <laughs> and um, uh, But working with the data and everything, you know, you, you realize its value. And um, it's kind of like uh, being a parent. You know, you always want your kid to be something they're not. People always want Grace to be something it's not. I mean, its forte is large scale. It's ideal for uh, global sea level change. Uh, global models are not, you know, and so um, we need to embrace what the positives are and then not emphasize, uh, uh, you know, trying to apply to a very small aquifer, you know, or things like that, you know, and I think the gridded product really helped. Um, but whenever I do studies, I try to work with people who produce data, if it's global modelers or regional modelers or groundwater level people. So I work with all of those uh, people uh, to make sure that I'm representing what they're doing appropriately. And so I think hydrologists um, should do that. And, and the thing that really convinces me that over the weekend, we were responding to reviewers' comments and some of the USGS people said, Grace is right for the Mississippi and, and the regional model is incorrect and it's outdated. So I felt like that was, that was we've come somewhere, you know, but anyway. Other questions? Well, I have another one then. Uh, so I'm going to take you a little bit, a little bit outside, maybe your your areas. But uh, you know, in another year or two, we're going to launch the surface water ocean topography mission. And the first two letters of that, surface water, are are certainly uh, applicable here. Do either of you have uh, a feel for how that will change uh, what you do and and might augment the Grace data? I do think that. Um that of the terrestrial water storage components, surface water is sort of the least appreciated um, in, in people studying the GRACE data uh, and, and least well understood. Um, I think we have a better understanding now that places like in the, uh, in the Amazon, um, surface water is a, is a significant component of terrestrial water storage. Um, and so having a mission like SWAT will enable us to better quantify the, the changes in, in surface water storage and, and better understand, therefore, um, how the component changes of terrestrial water storage contribute to the whole that's observed by GRACE, GRACE follow-on and future mass change missions. So yeah, I do think it's gonna be valuable. The other part of that is that, um, you know, we've always, we like to be able to close the water cycle, meaning, um, you know, the change in terrestrial water storage is equal to Precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus runoff, and we can, you know, we can observe precipitation fairly well. We can do okay. <clears throat> um, well, we're okay with it, with evapotranspiration, not great. <clears throat> and then runoff was something that was missing in terms of satellite-based observations. So the SWAT will enable us to to sort of close the water budget um, using all satellite-based observations. Um, I just add a little bit to that. I mean, I think it would be transformative. I mean, uh, I, last week I was talking to a group from Uganda. I mean, uh, and Ashraf had pulled uh, altimetry data for Lake Victoria and stuff. And so they're concerned. They're so dependent on hydropower, you know, and, and what's, uh, are they vulnerable 
uh, to climate cycles uh, and teleconnections. And, and so the more data that we have uh, on reservoir storage and things like that will help us understand the linkages between hydropower and, and uh, um, you know, climate forcing and stuff. So that's just one example, but I mean, I'm sure there'll be lots and lots more. So I think it'd be huge. Thank you. I have a couple of questions in the chat here. The first one is, uh, were there cases when the GRACE data was somewhat wrong and traditional gram water model was correct? If there was such a case, then what was the reason? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, for the uh, Central Valley, maybe the GRACE data wasn't as accurate as the Central Valley, but it got the, the general trends and everything. So. I mean, uh, so I, I think in that situation, maybe you would uh, um, believe the, the regional model more than the GRACE data, but they were both very fairly similar. And in most cases, we didn't have regional models that overlap with the GRACE data because it's a total career to update those regional models. I mean, it is a nightmare uh, to pull all those data together. So uh, we have very few um, that uh, corresponded, uh, you know, overlapped in time, and it's very difficult for them to update them uh, and keep those um, um, alive. The Northern High Plains, I think that, that was a good one. I mean, I think most of the regional models are not getting the dynamics of recharge. Uh, they simplify the recharge and they're not getting the dynamics that we see in GRACE. And the global models um, overestimated, I think, depletion in many of these aquifers when we did the comparison with the global models. Um, so I think we have a ways to go. Modeling is pretty complicated. I'll just add to that, that I think um, in most cases, you know, the GRACE data are not wrong. It's a matter of misinterpretation. Um, and so I would give it as an example, uh, you know, I worked on a study um, in the High Plains Aquifer where we have a lot of observations and the observations didn't, um, didn't match up with what we're observing from GRACE right away. And what we realized is there are different levels of, you know, there's, there's the deeper High Plains Aquifer and then there are these shallow alluvial aquifers and they're not necessarily um, both well represented in the, in the observations. But when you, when you do a careful analysis and account for both of them, um, as well as the soil moisture, then you get a much better comparison with the GRACE observations. And we've seen something similar in India where most of their, most of their ground-based um, groundwater observations are measuring just the shallow, unconfined aquifer, and they're not measuring the deeper aquifers that are being depleted. Um, and so there are some studies, you know, <laughs> they were actually published that said that, you know, GRACE is overestimating the depletion in northern India. You know, my response is, no, it's not. You're, <laughs> you're looking at these shallow um, uh, well observations that, that don't tell the whole story about, about total groundwater change in, in India. But I mean, uh, Steve, just one last point, then the, the Floridan was a case, you know, where there was discrepancy between JPL and, and Center for Space Research, uh, as far as from my, so it wasn't very reliable, so we didn't do uh, a detailed comparison, but I wouldn't trust probably um, the GRACE data very highly for that sort of system. All right, I have one more question here. Uh, when estimating groundwater changes, how do, you, how do you remove signals of snow and ice, uh, tree water content, content, surface water bodies from the total water storage measurements? Um, so we typically use other observations or models and, and this is not going to be perfect. Um, I can I can say that the the biomass water storage changes we did a study on that back in 2005 and we were able to determine that those are um, within the uncertainty level of of uh, gray so they're, they're they're pretty small compared to the other components um, but if you if you happen to be in a region where uh, snow water equivalent and soil moisture uh, are and surface water perhaps are, are significant components of terrestrial water storage and <clears throat> And usually, you know, one or more of those is is a very um, significant component. Then you better do a good job modeling them, or else, you know, your results are going to be um, imperfect. And and I think that's what we have to accept is that those in removing those other quantities, we we do end up with imperfect results. And it's just a matter of accounting for that in our uncertainty bars. Do you want to add anything to that, Bridget? Uh, 
Well, uh, I guess the, the other thing, Matt, is just like your 2018 paper, you know, is uh, total water storage is a very, uh, an excellent measurement. And I think we could put a lot of emphasis on that to begin with, you know, rather than always jumping to, um, you know, groundwater or something else. So I think we can uh, learn a lot uh, from total water storage. Uh, Matt Pritchard has a question, Matt. Yes, no, thanks uh, for these great presentations. Um, Bridget, I guess I, my, I was curious about your work at the Powell Center. So I've been involved in the Powell Center a little bit on the uh, volcano uh, connections between the USGS and the remote sensing community. I'm just wondering um, if you could just say a little bit about, I think one of the themes that's come out of today's meeting is really the need for interdisciplinary communication and you know people who are learning to speak the same language. And sort of, you know, going to sessions, you know, outside your field, you know, whether it's hydrologists going to learn about uh, space gravity or whatever, that there's a lot of a learning curve and, it, you know, we're not always communicating to each other. So I guess I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts based on that experience with the Powell Center where you were bringing together this sort of interdisciplinary group on, on how to break down uh, barriers between groups, what are lessons learned that could be transferred? Do we need to all go on whitewater rafting trips to be able to make this happen? <laughs> what do you, what do you think? I think so. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the power group uh, was excellent. And Matt participated in another power group. I guess it's a little bit different. But um, uh, it, you know, we had these week long meetings uh, with uh, people from, you know, NASA and uh, UT Center for Space Research, and then many USGS folks, the people that were doing the groundwater level monitoring, people doing regional modeling and everything all together. And I think it really helped the conversation and then uh, it helped them understand the grace a lot better too. Um, but, um, and so I think that, that was uh, really good. And then Ashraf did uh, a lot of the data analysis for different groups. It's still very difficult. And I, I think, um, you know, most of my collaboration with the USGS is with some retired people uh, who seem to have more time to devote to, to some of these things. This, uh, you know, we had funding for one postdoc, so everything else was kind of on our own. But um, the other thing I think about all this uh, large group research that we do these days, and you write a paper and you have everybody and their brother on it, and everybody agrees and the co-authors don't even read it. You know, it's very difficult to get critical viewpoints in this, these sorts of settings until you send it out for review and they nuke it, you know. Um, so I think um, uh, I benefited from working with USGS guys and learned a lot from them, even in the past few weeks. Uh, and um, so it, it's a lot of back and forth, one-on-one, -on -one and you know, talking with the people that are developing new Mississippi models, talking about their airborne EM and all of this stuff. So it's a huge career, you know. Uh, but the Powell really helped, the Powell Center and, and that approach. Matt, I don't know what you would say from your experience with Powell meetings. Yes, whitewater rafting. Um, <laughs> no, we unfortunately didn't do that when I was involved in the, the Powell Center. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, getting these cross-community collaborations are, are really important. And, and that's what I was saying before about, you know, these meetings between geodesists and hydrologists really helped um, it's helped geodesists understand what the hydrologists needed, and then the hydrologists became more interested and embraced the the data. You know, one of the struggles we have now is um, is is the uh, researched applications. Um, you know, you can develop a tool, scientists can develop a tool, but then actually getting that into operations is is so difficult because typically so many, you know, the people who work on a weather forecast or a, or a stream flow forecast. You know, they they spend ninety five percent of their time just churning out the product, and maybe only a five percent of their time available for research and and looking at something new, and uh, and so that's I think one of the struggles that we have is you know we could develop new new um, you know useful products that make use of Grace and other data, but then um, the the uptake is is really hard um, to to push that along. I just like to add one other thing, you know, we're talking about satellite gravimetry, but uh, I think uh, ground-based gravimetry is way underutilized also, you know, I mean, it would help with the storage coefficients in the Mississippi and all of that sort of thing with their regional model, but instead they spent a bomb on airborne EM, you know, 
which is great to have too. But ground-based gravimetry is a real nice supplement to uh, satellite gravimetry. Right, there were a couple of questions at the end of Bridget's talk that I want to return to. There were related questions. One was, uh, which one was right in the Mississippi Grace or groundwater model? And the second one was related to that, which is, uh, how do you relate these differences in the Mississippi Basin to uncertainties in the different data sets that you used? Um, so uh, the, the first question, uh, which one is right? Uh, so the uh, regional model that was being uh, used in the past that was developed before was uh, published in 2009. So it's quite dated and, uh, and they've been updating it uh, since. And um, the, the recent data that I've gotten on some of that suggests very low changes in, in storage in some of those units. So it seems like uh, Grace is on the right track. And um, I think uh, some of the things is that under representation of stream aquifer interaction in the regional model, uh, then I just found out today they had some problems with uh, cells going dry and represented them mostly as confined cells. And, you know, so there are a lot of things. Uh, it was a, a, the first uh, um, model developed for the region. So I think now they're uh, improving it a lot. And I think Grace will help constrain some of those uh, results. And, and what was the second question, Steve? Oh, just about the second part of that was oh, just yeah, about the, the uncertainties. The yeah. So, so the, the, there's a lot, there, there's no shortage of uncertainties in everything. And uh, I think a conceptual understanding, conceptual models, uh, you know, um, and uh, now the de developing easier ways that the original model had 43 stream networks. Now they have uh, a thousand, uh, thousand kilometers of stream network from NHD plus, and that should help uh, with that. The airborne EM will help with uh, looking at the connectivity between streams and groundwater and improve recharge modeling. You have to start to somewhere, you know, with an initial model. And so I think um, uh, now they're improving it. And I'm hoping that uh, the USGS will use GRACE data to constrain uh, their regional models in the future. There was a follow-on question about the ground-based gravimetry. Uh, so the question was, um, how much use of ground-based gravimetry has been done to look at the GRACE results, you know, compare them? Um, uh, Don Poole at uh, USGS in Arizona is, um, has done a lot of ground-based gravimetry, and so he's done some uh, limited comparisons for the Arizona alluvial system uh, there, but uh, we don't have the networks uh, um, in place uh, to do, you know, a larger scale comparison between GRACE and uh, ground-based gravimetry, but I think we should be moving in that direction. I would imagine uh, one of the problems is that the ground-based measurements are very sensitive locally and uh, GRACE has given you, you know, a 300 kilometer average. And so it may be very hard to compare a single ground-based measurement to GRACE. Oh, definitely, definitely. But I mean, well, I, you know, I think with, yeah, go, oh, sorry, ahead. go ahead, Bridget. Uh, I was just gonna say that, um, I, you know, it's really cool what Bridget was saying about if you have a ground-based gravimeter or co-located with a with a uh, a well measurement then you can use the information to to understand for example the storage coefficient which is which is pretty cool um, in terms of difficulties though, I would say that I, I've also seen um, at least one other study where they were looking they were comparing uh, the the ground-based gravimetry with other observations and um, and one of the complications if you if you have a mountain range around they actually saw where uh, this this mountain range, um, when it had snow on it, that caused the uh, that actually you know sort of <laughs> pulled upward on the gravimeter, so you had like the opposite you know effect. There was more water in the area, but but um, but less gravitational potential at the site of the gravimeter. So it, it you know requires some some careful interpretation. Okay, guys, uh, well, we're to the end of our time. And so I'm going to uh, thank our speakers, Bridget and Matt. Those are great. And I'm going to pass it back to Matt for some, uh, Matt Pritchard, for some closing comments. Great. No, thank you, Steve and Bridget and Matt. That was a great session. I think a lot of good lessons learned, and we all learned um, some new stuff there. All right. So um, this is, a, we're going to have a, a final sort of discussion and um, uh, a couple of comments from a couple of 
speakers that came up earlier today. Um, so let me just show you. And I also sort of tried to do a little summary of, of things I heard today. So this is just sort of my uh, hot take on, on what was happening today. And, uh, and in the final few minutes here, we're glad to take any additional thoughts or things that I uh, missed that uh, we should talk about um, more. But um, I, I feel like it was an extremely successful day. I thank all the speakers for giving great presentations. I feel like we've shown uh, today that there's been amazing progress in applying geophysical data to a variety of different type of environmental applications that improve the spatial and temporal resolution or ability to measure certain phenomena. Um, so here's just a, a partial list of some of the things we heard today. I think the other really interesting thing was just the variety of types of geophysics that were used today. Um, it's not just um, you know environmental seismology or environmental geodesy or environmental geoelectrics that really there is you know, each one of these techniques has its strengths and weaknesses, uh, but used together, there is, uh, they're quite an impressive arsenal. So, and, and again, also talking about the different ways that these data are measured, ground-based, submarine, airborne, satellite, active and passive uh, techniques. And so I think that was sort of another big take home I had is, is not only the diversity of applications, but the diversity of types of geophysical data. Um, and so that also sort of prompts thinking about the challenges and opportunities of how do we take the next step of hey, we found, detected a great signal on our geophysical network or using our geophysical measurements. And how do we then make um, it useful to society or what is the application that we can make? And I heard uh, sort of many different themes in terms of the environmental applications, but the one that I, I sort of felt like summarized it a lot is that I think we're sort of at a, a point where there's a value in a community organization uh, on these topics. And of course, there's several separate communities. There's a, a you know groups that, Sort of focus on just one technique or focus on one application, but I feel like there is uh, evidence in the talks today that we could accomplish more um, working together across a variety of, of fields of geophysics and talking across um, many different types of applications. And so there were many comments made about facilities, and I, I feel like um, you know a couple of things we heard a couple of times is you know both the need uh, for you know. Kudos to our existing facilities, um, uh, but there's always new data sets coming along and lots of new challenges that we as a community of geophysicists uh, need to, to think about. In particular, um, data sets are growing in volume. Uh, the type in, of data sets may not be the same as what we have archived in the past. Um, there are huge data sets that need to be processed. Uh, I think another theme that came across was, uh, you know, there's a lot of interdisciplinarity, both among different types of geophysics, but also dealing with other communities of hydrologists or oceanographers or geomorphologists. Um, and so as a community, maybe that is, will be something that we can engage in a little bit more. Um, certainly the question of funding came up many times of both, um, you know, a lot of, again, kudos for existing agencies for funding PI-led projects that lead to these discoveries. Um, but then the question is sort of, where do we go next? How do we fund these for operational use? And uh, I think there were a lot of question marks on, on how all of that can happen and um, sort of more discussions of best practices and, and examples that could be used uh, to make that sort of routine uh, societal benefit more widespread. Um, and I think another great question um, that came up a couple of times was outreach um, to communicate what uh, type of signals geophysicists are now detecting. Um, are we uh, too geared in uh, the jargon of being uh, data heads and, and signal processing um, gurus that we can't always take it the last mile to get to the user. And are we sort of not helping people understand what our capabilities are um, and, and how that data can be used? And, and so I think the question of communication across disciplines is one that, um, again, um, things like the Powell Center certainly help that, but those are sort of short-lived um, activities that we need to find longer ways to sustain them. All right, so that's sort of my, my quick hot take. I'm glad to take any other comments in the chat, um, but I did have a couple of points that came up that I wanted to give a couple of people a chance to further elaborate upon. And so let's see if we can make this happen. So, um, uh, so both Ben Phillips and uh, Rebecca Bendick um, from UNAVCO and from NASA respectively will um, wanted to uh, have a couple of discussion points. So let's see if we can bring them into the conversation. First of all, um, Ben, maybe I'll have you go first. And um, so there was this, some discussion earlier today about 
um, you know, the question of funding some of these type of environmental applications of geodesy and, um, you know, some case studies of it's not always easy to get that funding um, from some program solicitations uh, if they don't always think that, for example, GMSS is a NASA instrument. So um, I just wondered if you wanted a chance to respond to that. Hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, let me know if I'm not coming through clearly, um, and I'll, I'll cut out the video. But um, well, I, first of all, thanks very much to the committee for you know, bringing together this topic and, and to all the speakers um, for, for really interesting talks. And I wanted to echo your comment, Matt, about you know opportunities across disciplines and across measurement types. Um, and you know, in the context of these uh, presentations today, the you know, this last session. And the first, um, you know, Grace and GPS is a fantastic example there, um, you know, for bridging, uh, uh, you know, scale, uh, uh, you know, scale issues uh, and, and across disciplines, for example, in, you know, in areas covered in some of the presentations, the Central Valley and, and Sierra Nevada and studies that have been done, uh, you know, um, integrating GPS and Grace and showing that, you know, there are there's, for, for example, um, you know, additional water storage in a in, uh, uh, basement in the Sierra Nevada that isn't potentially captured in some hydrology models. So I'm, I'm really interested in, um, you know, the opportunities for, for further bridging these communities and, you know, getting to hydrogeodesy and, and really linking up, you know, hydrology and solid earth um, uh, investigators to, you know, make more progress in these areas. And, and so on, on the GNSS front, um, yeah, fun, fundamentally from my perspective um, and, and sort of the NASA mantra of, of you know, focusing on remote sensing observations from space, well, GPS and GNSS are satellite-based observations. Um, you, know, the, you don't get anything at your receiver um, without, without the constellations up there. Uh, and so from my perspective, that's, you know, uh, an area that's fully responsive and, and uh, an area in which you know, NASA has um, historically and continues to make significant investments from you know, hardware to analysis to, to research. Um, uh, so, you know, of course, we, we uh, have invested in some of the early networks and, and have our global GNSS network uh, and um, you know, analysis systems and, and products that that contribute, you know, broadly to our, um, you know, both to our space-based missions and to, to basic research. Uh, we have a GNSS uh, science team, which is explicitly, you know, interdisciplinary um, to leverage and, and promote, you know, advancements using GNSS um, for our science. We call for it uh, also explicitly through our annual ESI solicitation as, you know, as one of the relevant data types. So. Um, so I, I can't speak necessarily to per perhaps some historical, uh, uh, you know, challenges, but um, certainly you know critical uh, and relevant data type for for NASA, especially where you know there's um, an opportunity to to really promote advancements in in technology or or analysis to you know to get at new science um, and and certainly. Um, as I kind of as I started to to integrate GNSS um, data with other mass relevant data types, so that's that's my perspective. Great, thanks. And in case I didn't introduce Ben properly, Ben is a program director of the Earth Service and Interior Program at NASA. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, so I will try to introduce our next speaker. It's is Bex Bendick, who is the president of NAVCO, which is the NSF funded facility um, geodesy and. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Bex. So oh, I, I won't hog too much time. I just wanted to say that I thought this was a really interesting discussion um, in a bunch of, of topics were raised throughout the day um, that I think we've been talking about a lot inside of UNAVCO because our two highest priorities for this year and the few years to come are one, to aggressively build out data federations that would allow cross-disciplinary data sets to be much more discoverable and hopefully much more interoperable. So, 
you know, the vision is that the days of having to know the special website where you pick up weird data set X are gone, that there will be tools that leverage cloud cyber infrastructure that mean that you never really know which data archives the interesting things that you're pulling is coming are coming from, um, but they should be much easier to find in the future. Um, and in concert with that, we really recognize that um, it's one thing to find interesting data sets and it's another to be able to use them. So there was a lot of discussion about you know, requiring kind of expertise in a particular data format or analysis technique. And uh, I think inside UNAVCO, we really view that as a barrier toward the most innovative cross-disciplinary science. And so hand in hand with building out these data federations, we're working on tools that would allow data to be much more interoperable and to be processed by people who don't necessarily have that highest level of domain expertise. Um, and we really feel that that will enable the next generation of exciting discoveries. And, and so on that note, I really would urge this group to reach out to me or anyone on the data team at UNAVCO because we're actively looking for interesting use cases and we're actively looking for information about how we should prioritize federating data. So would the most useful thing be to, you know, we already have beta products that allow you to see SAR holdings and the GPS holdings, but is the next thing we bring on, should it be race or should it be modus or should it be you know geochemical data it would be really great to hear from the community what what are your dream scenarios what are the interesting use cases that we can work towards so please do reach out this is a huge priority for UNAVCO and obviously as we join forces with IRIS um, integration of geodetic and seismic data is will clearly be totally seamless going forward. Great, thank you so much, Bex. That's a, a great note to end upon today. Um, so I don't see any other comments in the chat or Q&A, but I will say that there was a question from Rosemary uh, Knight uh, about uh, how big is this community? How many people attended today's webinar? It's not always obvious to the attendees. So I think uh, maybe Deb can correct me, but I sort of saw us max out around 160. Um, and we have, you know, at least 70 people or so are sticking around to the bitter end. Um, so uh, I think there's a huge amount of interest. I think there were over 300 people who had registered um, some form of interest in this webinar. So um, I think that there really is a lot of enthusiasm around this topic that uh, hopefully will be ready going forward. All right, yes, and Deb is just telling me that my number of 160 was just how many are live. That's not even the number of YouTube viewers. So um, just to give you a sense of the, of the scale of the interest in the topic. So anyway, so I think we'll end there. Finally, um, I'd just like to thank on behalf of the committee, I want to thank all the speakers and each of you for attending. As a reminder, the recordings will be available um, on the website in a few days, and we'll be sending out a short evaluation after the meeting. And if you have a moment, please consider providing some feedback so we can continue to improve these meetings, which happen several times per year. So thank you again, and I hope you have a great uh, afternoon. <laughs>